Well, it is nine o'clock, so I would like to call the meeting to order at 9 a.m. As a courtesy, if you are not speaking, please mute your audio so there are no inter uh, interruptions or background noise. <clears throat> For the record, I'll note that the public meeting notice was properly posted as required by law, and the notice of this board meeting was provided to each of the directors. As of this morning, I have not heard that any directors would not be in attendance. <clears throat> please poll the board for attendance and when your name is called, please unmute yourself and indicate that you are here. Director Flores. Here. here. Director Callis. Here. Director Taylor. Here. Director Abraham. Director Boren. Director Fernandez. Here. Director Henderson. Here. Director Huber. Here. Director Crone. Here. Director Lachance. Here. Director Lattimore. Here. Director Leslie. Here. Director Lloyd. Here. <clears throat> Director Luton. Here. Director Rankin. Here. Director Ruiz. Director Sanderson. Here. Director Savage. Here. Director Smith. Here. Director Wilson. Here. Let's check on Director Boren one more time. I'm pretty I'm sure pretty I saw sure him dial in. Director, Director Boren, are you Boren? with us? All right, we do have a quorum of the board. Now we will move into our public comment section of our agenda. For those commenting, please note the board may not deliberate on items that are not posted on our agenda. Additionally, we do not place to play, plan to place a time limit on public comment unless we feel the time being taken is affecting others' ability to address the board. <clears throat> If you are on the call and are here to make comments relating to agenda item number two regarding BRA permitting associated with PD's RV resort at Possum Kingdom Lake, I would ask that when I call your name, please let me know. And I'll ask you to hold off making your comments until we get into that specific agenda item. When we get to agenda item two, I will call on you to make your comments at that time. Is there anyone online wishes to make a public comment? Hearing none, we will proceed to the regular <laughs> agenda item. Our first agenda item is report and possible discussion on general manager CEO report by David Collingsworth, general manager CEO. Thank you, presiding officer Flores. Uh, good morning to members of the board. Good morning to the members of the public uh, that are following along. We're glad to have you. Uh, we have quite an agenda today, so I, I don't have much of a report to give other than to remind folks that this will be our last virtual meeting. Uh, we're excited to move back in and, and, and have meetings in person in July. Uh, and then also on June the 3rd, we will have our second brown bag uh, with the Brazos, and that will be virtual. Uh, so we hope that you tune in, and we've got some exciting things to talk about on June, uh, actually, yeah, June the 3rd at noon. So uh, I'll turn the program back over to you. All right. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Agenda item number two. We will hear comments from the public, hear a report from staff, and discussion and possible action on BRA <laughs> permitting issues associated with Petey's RV Resort at Possum <clears throat> Kingdom Lake by Mike McClendon, Upper Basin Regional Manager. But before we hear from Mike, we would like to hear from a few people who were asked to address the board. We will begin by calling Mrs. Carrie French. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. We do really appreciate it. This has been uh, a long, a long process, and um, so it, it, it took about a year almost to, to get here before you. So thank you. Again, my name is Carrie French. I'm um, representing today neighbors for the protection of Willow Beach Slough at Possum Kingdom Lake. Um, we residents are are very concerned that the local BRA office did not sufficiently consider the safety concerns um, or follow board approved regulations when approving commercial on water facilities for placement in this cove at the end of Willow Beach Slough. Um, for that reason, we believe that these permits should be withdrawn and we will, if you'll um, allow, give you um, a bit of an outline for, for why we feel that way. If we can switch. I guess, Lisa, do you want me to just let you know when to? Okay, here we go. Here we yes, ma'am, please. So slide two quickly uh, about us. Uh, neighbors for the um, protection of Willow Beach Slough, we represent over 40 families who live at Possum Kingdom Lake at the end of the slough. Includes uh, two homeowners associations for the Willows and Ponderosa condominiums. Um, residents all along the peninsula have also joined in support and we have near, uh, nearly a thousand signatures now on our, um, our, our uh, petition, actually that we don't even circulate, it's just from visitors to our site. So um, Lisa, next slide. A little bit about the cove, and this is really important. So, at the end of at the end of Willow Beach Slough, this is the cove where they're placing the commercial commercial docks. It, it's the end of a very long no wake zone, uh, narrow ingress egress, a very shallow cove, shallow water. Um, at the very center of the end of this cove, there's actually a pole that sticks up out of the water. And at that pole, it's about 14 feet. And then it just becomes more shallow as you go along. Um, below the surface, there are several large rocks, uh, trees, um, other water hazards. And when I say hazards, I mean hazards to props and boats. Um, and for that reason, there is very minimal boat traffic in this cove which makes it perfect for non-motorized recreational activities, which you'll see a lot of in this cove. Um, and, and Lisa, if you'll switch to the next slide. Yeah, so lots of swimming, um, you know, lots of families out there floating on their water mats. They put up water slides. You'll see lots of uh, kayaking, sailing, um, those types of activities. Again, because there's not a lot of boat traffic through this area and it tends to be very shallow. Okay, uh, next slide. So in June of 2020, residents in the area were notified by a big green sign that PD's RV park was coming soon to the seven acre lot that is across the cove um, from me and the Willows condominiums. Um, now that in itself was really not a big deal. It's the size of the project that actually led to all of the concern. Um, the size on a single lot that they're planning. And if you'll look at the characteristics here, I've kind of outlined, um, and keep in mind, this is a seven acre lot. You have over 25,000 square feet of septic drain fill, 82 
RV sites with full hookups, 48 um, boat rental slips, bungalow rentals, two swimming pools, because according to their um, park guidelines, they are not going to allow uh, swimming in the lake for their customers. Pool house with, you know, restroom and shower facilities, office with exercise facilities, laundry, overflow parking, et cetera. So it's a very large project in itself for this cove. Um, but what, what we'd like to speak to you about today specifically are the boat rentals. And I do want to add that this is a short-term RV park facility with the maximum stay of two weeks. Okay, Lisa, next slide. So just to summarize, um, just to summarize just briefly, the community's concerns, um, these are, you know, topics that we won't discuss all of these obviously today. Number one, negative environmental impact. Um, you know, we're, we've been all along very concerned about the large commercial septic tank that's being placed on this cove. Again, this cove is very shallow. There's not a lot of flow. It is not directly connected to the main part of the lake or the channel. So again, it tends to, to fluctuate um, in depth and tends to be very shallow. Um, so this is all, you know, accumulation of contaminants in the cove for runoff and septic are, are, are big issues. And actually we have an environmental specialist with us today who can sum that up quickly if we have time and we have questions. I'll skip through the others, but you can see that there are a lot of concerns that we've been dealing with, the county and so on and so forth. But um, today, um, I specifically want to talk to you about boating and water safety. That's our primary focus. Uh, next slide. Okay. So going back to, I said this has been an ongoing process. Uh, going back to March of 2020, now this is prior to the sale of the PD's property, okay? And PD's, the, the Jordan Anderson Ventures Group, um, for the purposes of today, we're talking about, they actually bought two lots, okay? Lot tract 3A and tract 2A, where they're putting commercial um, on water facilities. But going back to March of 2020, prior to the sale, um, the PD's property owner, Mr. Mike Patterson of, I guess, Patterson PK Partners, he was the owner. As you can read in this email um, obtained through open records request, a local dock builder approached Kent Edwards at the local BRA office for a verbal approval that commercial docks could be placed in this cove, um, quote, so that he can move forward with the sale. So this was an important part of the overall property sale. Um, he mentions that they do not want to go out for engineered drawings if, if this is not possible. And he ends with thoughts from all, question mark. And you'll see that this email was addressed to four BRA inspectors managers asking specifically for their thoughts. But apparently not a single one of them actually responded to this email. Um, because we have no further correspondence. We specifically requested through open records request a follow-up, uh, any follow-up correspondence to this email, and we were told that there was none. Um, not one of the four actually followed up with their thoughts. <laughs> Yet the sale did move forward uh, between Mr. Patterson and the commercial developers, Jordan Anderson Ventures. Um, Again, Jordan Anderson Ventures also purchased a second tract, which is the Silent Water Manufactured Home Park in this cove. Um, you can see the markups attached uh, that were by the dock builder at that time. Um, you can see that they're on the kind of the bottom of the photo where the three yellow squares are. That is tract 3A where PD's RV Park will be. So they're wanting to put three facilities there. And then if you look up to the right there, you'll see the circular driveway. That is Silent Waters Manufactured Home Park where they're planning. They transferred one facility. There's a small boat ramp and they plan to add an existing commercial <sighs> facility there. So this is this here on the right, this is your first bird's eye view of the entire cove. Okay. Now this, to be fair, um, 
was in 2015 when water levels were very low. Uh, so please keep that in mind, although the, the cove again tends to be extremely shallow with only being 14 feet right in the very center. Okay, next slide. <laughs> okay, so um, on this slide, I wanted you to be able to see the cove from two different perspectives. On the left, you'll see when the cove was, um, you, you know, during um, drought period, 2015. This to the right, is a picture of the cove at full capacity or, you know, present day. Um, now we've added the red around the edges because I, I want you to be able to realize and be able to estimate, and this is a conservative estimate, just how much of the cove actually remains to be very, very shallow. In fact, too shallow for boats, um, even when the lake is full. And again, at the center, and you can kind of see there at the center there at the end of that cove, again, it's only about 14 feet. It goes out to just within less than <coughs> two feet, probably around the edges in some places. The yellow there dots um, did the best we could to try to represent approximate locations of where uh, there are large rocks or trees uh, other underwater hazards that we local residents know to avoid, um, newcomers or visitors to the lake do not. And we've seen a couple come into that cove and ruin props uh, trying to park along the shoreline um, in those areas. Okay, so again, again, as you can see, and then at the bottom of that, you can see where the docks are for uh, the Willows condominiums there and the Ponderosa condominiums. Again, it's a very narrow path to navigate boats in and out of there. Um, even just two boats passing opposite directions. Um, add in all of the residents swimming and their activities. Um, and that's even before, I mean, this is a tight area, even before you add in four 4,100 square foot commercial docks and then you know, 50 transient boat rental slips, plus, you know, three to 500 people on that cove, depending on, um, you know, a week, what weekend. All right, five, nine, we're gonna skip to the next, okay. So in July of 2020, uh, Jordan Anderson Ventures actually submitted their um, on water facility applications. So five commercial dock applications were submitted to BRA in July of 2020. Again, these are five facilities for two shoreline lots, uh, one small boat ramp that already existed but will now be used for uh, commercial service to the RV park, uh, one transfer of an existing water facility with two slips, and then four new commercial on-water facility applications. Each of the four is 4,100 square feet. Um, that's four facilities, 12 boat slips each, 48 new transient rental boat slips in this small cove. And each of these structures, these are not, you know, singular side-by-side -side slips like you see with the Willows and the Ponderosa where they're, you know, these are going to extend out into this cove a uh, hundred feet each. Okay, next slide. Slide 10. Okay. So, this slide is an example of one of the five permanent applications that was submitted. And um, I just wanted to include this point, uh, just to point out a, a few things. Um, again, this is one of the three new commercial dock permit applications submitted for Tract 3A specifically. Um, number one, you can see I've, I've numbered them. Number one, I just want to point out that the previous landowner is still the lien holder, Mr. Patterson, who had um, obviously, uh, you know, this was important to him early on. He's, it's still an, uh, obviously an important um, 
part of this project as the lien holder. Track 3A, I want to point out, is a single shoreline lot. And also, I want to point out that on this and the other uh, commercial dock permit applications for track 3A, they have incorrectly marked the acreage as 12 over. I can't read because it's scratched through, but <coughs> correct the number 12.85 or 12.75. I'm not sure, but over 12 acres. And this is represented incorrectly on all three applications submitted for this lot. Um, the correct acreage is 7.26. And we've been told several times that, that several sets of eyes have looked at these applications. They've been scrutinized to every detail through the standard review process. And, and, I, and I would just ask, you know, did all of these people who looked at this approve these, these uh, applications, assuming incorrectly that they were 12 plus acre lots? Or, you know, did they just not look closely enough at the details to notice the error? Um, I'm, I'm, I'll say I'm a small business owner and I have been through the process of permitting and licensing through the state of Texas. And I can tell you right now that an error like that would never have been overlooked in the experience that, um, that I've been through with licensing. Uh, next slide. So on the left, you can see that they have the DRA requires an engineered uh, drawing for commercial. So this is the engineered drawing of the structure. Um, it is four marinas, 54 by 74. Again, 12, 10 by 24 slips with a thin way that is 26 feet. So it will extend the maximum allowable to 100 feet each one. Um, now, the placement on the right, the placement markup on the right, the picture was done by the dock builder and not an engineer. I do want to point out that I verified that there was no engineering professional involved in the placement of these oversized structures in this cove. Um, and then, again, I've numbered uh, just for reference moving forward. I've numbered these docks um, in case anybody wants to refer back. So uh, one, two, and three are proposed for one lot, one single lot for track 3A. And then docks four and five are proposed for one lot track 2A, along with, you can see there, um, a small boat route. <coughs> Okay, and this is what was submitted in July of 2020. Okay, um, next slide. Um, you can see in the next slide there are. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll point out. So this was this was submitted in July of 2020. Um, they weren't approved until January. So. BRA actually held on to these applications. They withheld a decision for six months while they waited on word on the OSSF application. <coughs> so, you know, all the residents had six months, actually over six months, uh, to call and write the BRA, and they did. They called, they wrote, they discussed, uh, you know, the obvious public safety and private property risks here. I mean, keep in mind, these Willows docks and these Ponderosa docks are very expensive facilities. They were designed for this cove to be low traffic facilities, low traffic slips. So, you know, there's, we have no idea, no way of knowing what the high traffic that this uh, park and these, these facilities will bring might do to um, the damage it might be due to these facilities. Again, residents um, pled uh, with the BRA to consider the safety, the safety of their families, their children, their grandchildren, because this is an area where there's a lot of non-motorized activity. Again, it's shallow. There's not a lot of boat activity to date. Um, public relations representatives, I will say, were very, very polite and thoughtful. Um, you know, everyone from the central office assured concerned residents that their voices would be heard. But 
I can tell you definitely no one, not one of them, not one of us feels like our voices were heard or any of the points that we, we made were considered <coughs> in the decision. So next slide. So in January of 2021, despite the imminent risk of property damage, personal injury, or worse, and in clear violation of sex, Section 8 on water facilities as published in the regulation of Brazos River Authority Lakes and Associated Lands, the updated 2014 online version, all five on-water facility permit applications submitted by Jordan Anderson Ventures were approved as originally submitted by the developer without modification by the BRA office at Boston County Light. <coughs> Next slide. So I just put this slide in here because there was, you know, besides shock from pretty much everyone, um, there were some public outrage. I mean, the residents in this cove were very upset by this decision. No one actually thought that this bond water facility plan would ever be approved. First of all, it just doesn't make any sense for safety purposes in this cove. But secondly, it absolutely violates uh, BRA regulations for on-water facilities. However, in the correspondence that we received back from the BRA in response to our um, calls and emails, there were some very specific um, but consistent uh, answers back. Things like, and I've highlighted these for you to see, rules and regulations must, apply, must be applied equitably across the board. Um, they can't arbitrarily deny permits. They had to approve them because all they have to follow, uh, they have to follow the rules and regulations. They have to apply them equally. Um, these dock applications fell completely within the rules. Um, so we'll take a look at the rules and we'll, I'll show you that they absolutely do not fall within the rules. But one other thing before I, I, I want to point out that other verbiage that was very consistent across the board and in the responses were the fact that they, they kept saying that BRA doesn't get involved in neighbor disputes, disputes between neighboring property owners, um, things like that. And they kept saying neighbor disputes. That's insulting, really, because these, these commercial developers, they're not our neighbors, okay? This is our home. They don't live in this cove. They don't. We do. They don't live in this cove. They actually live in another part of the lake, both of them, that doesn't allow and would never allow a project like this, okay, because they have a homeowners association that prevents it. And I think one of them actually sits on the board of that HOA. So to dismiss our concerns as just dispute between neighbors is, is really insulting. I just want to point that out. Um, so on to um, the rules and, you know, does, do these facilities actually tell you how they do? So we can look at that now if you want to switch to the next slide. Okay. So the next two slides are actually pictures that were sent to us by the BRA to explain, um, I guess, all of the measurements that they used um, to, you know, I guess, investigate this, this dock plan. Um, as you can see, this is again, the 2015 aerial when the cove is low. Um, but, you know, there, there are some pretty, I mean, if you look at proximity, uh, if you look at what was what I labeled as uh, Dock 4, which is over at Silent Waters Manufactured Home Park, I mean, shore to shore distances are less than 300 feet. Okay. We could switch to the next slide, actually, to show the pool. Okay, so this is when the lake is full. <laughs> Even when the lake is full, all of that area that you just saw that was bare land before in the 2015, okay, that is still extremely shallow. 
too shallow for boating. Um, <laughs> you can see specifically now from dot four, looking out shoreline to shoreline, 246 feet to this shoreline, 249 feet across to the PD shoreline. One area that seems very obvious to me that they did not mark would be from the shoreline there at dock four, right across to the Willows condominium shoreline. For some reason that one's not marked, but I can tell you that it is just over 200 feet. It's about 220 feet. So it is all, all of these distances are under 300 feet, okay? So I just wanna point that out um, as we move, move along through the specific rules. So we can refer back to them if there are any questions. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, these are your own rules. These are board approved regulations for on-water facilities. Uh, this applies to all on-water facilities, whether residential or commercial. And it says in there, all on-water facilities must meet the following requirements. Okay. So now, number one, I put this in here because and I, I, I mean, it's it's a bit of a gray area and there's some subjectivity here too. And I think, you know, this this uh, regulation here, all on water facilities must be constructed and maintained in a structurally sound manner, which does not create a safety hazard or environmental concern. Okay. Obviously, I, I feel like the intent of this is to make, to make sure the structure itself is sound. Okay, it's not falling apart. It should be a danger that way. However, I wanted to note this because putting these oversized structures, these oversized structures, the fact that they're there um, in itself, the design, the size, the placement, the number in this small narrow cove is in itself a hazard. So that's why I um, have included the force regulation here. Okay, next uh, slide. So on water facilities may not be situated in a manner that unreasonably interferes or obstructs access <laughs> to other permitted facilities or neighboring neighboring properties. And I can show you on the next slide in just a moment, there's a, another picture, but we do believe that specifically that fourth dock at Silent Waters that extends 100 feet between two shorelines that, you know, just measure over 200 feet it's much too large a structure for this shallow cove, okay? Because that is the area where boats actually navigate. And you have to stay to the center to navigate to the north end of that cove. Otherwise, it's too shallow. And there are also, again, some, some hazards. So, you know, you had 50 boats coming in and out of that area. And that's just, common sense tells me that's just not going to work. There's going to be some um, interference. And obstruction. Um, next one. Now, I highlighted this one in red because I don't believe there's any subjectivity here. Okay. Um, there shall be no more than one on water facility on any one shoreline lot. So, this developer has two shoreline lots for which he has been allowed five on water facilities. Okay. Clear, unambiguous, <coughs> no question, a violation of this rule. That includes three commercial on water facilities on shoreline lot 3A and two commercial facilities on lot 2A. That includes one existing. Again, all you know, these rules apply to all on water facilities, whether residential or commercial. Now, I want to point out, uh, we can go ahead and slip to the next, next slide. I want to point out that one um, example that was sent to me by the BRA when we questioned this was that if you look at the Willows condominiums, for example, they have three sets of the side-by-side -side boat slips. Okay, well, first of all, by your own regulations, 
uh, condominium complexes are not considered commercial, okay? Because that's a different category. Uh, commercial boat slips are those for public use. Condominiums are private. They're privately owned and they are privately owned boat slips. So that's uh, not a valid example, even though these condominiums, I mean, besides the point, rather, these condominiums were built in, I think, the 80s. Um, so, uh, um, actually, you know what, and they also are on the tax rolls as four separate properties, uh, and they only have three facilities, okay. Uh, so, the next point, and, and you please keep in mind also as we go through this, the what I talked uh, mentioned earlier about obstruction to the north end of the cove, um, but um, rule number four, regulation four, on water facilities shall not extend more than one third the distance between opposite shorelines of any area of the lake where the distance between the shorelines is less than 300 feet. And I marked this one in red as well because without a doubt, this is a very clear, unambiguous violation. If you look at, at on water facility or dock four, that is the one at Silent Waters. Uh, the new one from Silent Waters Trailer Park, you can see that the distances are marked 246 feet to one shoreline, 249 feet to another. And I know they've tried to turn it just so slightly to, I guess, avoid the obvious that these are way too close together for this kind of dock. But you'll notice that in that picture where the lake is full on the right, there's no, again, there's no measurement between that shoreline at Silent Waters and straight across there through that dock to the Willow's condominiums. And it is about 220 feet, okay? And this dock facility proposed extends 100 feet. That's definitely more than a third the distance. Okay, uh, next slide. All right, the top here um, is not, it's, it's not actually a violation, but I thought it was very interesting, so I went ahead and, and noted it. So we actually, my family, we applied for a dock permit back in June of last year and were granted a permit. And you can see it actually, if you were to look back at that last slide, they actually, the BRA um, put a representation of what would be our residential facility that was permitted in that last um, that last shot. It's actually incorrectly placed. So I don't know, but nonetheless, it's there. When we did go through that process, um, they required us to have a survey. And I mean, it had been less than two years since we'd had a survey when we bought the property, but they require, required us to have a brand new survey to mark a stake exactly where our residential facility would, would begin. Um, no surveys were required for the placement of these on-water facilities, these commercial on-water facilities at either of the PD's properties. So if you'll go look down here to the next rule, BRA, C, BRA reserves the right in its sole discretion to further restrict on water facilities on lakes if the placement creates a hazard to navigation, results in nuisance, which is obvious, impairs the BRA's ability to operate and maintain the lake or interferes with or restricts access to adjacent properties. Again, I marked this in red because I believe that it, this is very clear. Um, the way the size of these docks, the number of them, the fact that you know this cove is very shallow, it's narrow to navigate, it's definitely um, a nuisance that this is not where BRA chose to exercise their discretion to further limit. In fact, they just did the opposite. And then to the next slide. Next slide, Lisa. Okay. So 
again, no, back one, back one. Back one slide, Lisa. Okay. So originally when these docs were approved and we, we continued to get responses that they had to approve them, they couldn't deny them because they fell completely within guidelines, blah, blah, blah. You know, once we started questioning the guidelines and questioning the regulations, the, the arguments sort of shifted and changed to, well, then it must be just a different interpretation. And then in that interpretation, the, um, they use this part of the regulation right here, which says additional requirements for commercial on-water facilities. Uh, due to the unique nature, uh, such facilities shall be evaluated on a case-by-case. -case. They reserve the right to establish appropriate restrictions, limitations, and requirements. Okay. Um, this is not, this is not a, a free-for-all. Okay. I mean, I understand that there are potentially unique circumstances, but clearly additional requirements for commercial on-water facilities clearly means extra supplementary in addition to or added to the regulations already listed in 8B, okay? Um, this paragraph by no means implies that board approved rules for on-water facilities do not apply or should not be applied to commercial facilities. Although when um, one of our representatives was in a meeting with the local PK office and some of the managers and asked about this specifically, um, he was asking specifically about having multiple facilities on one shoreline lot. Um, they were told, oh, well, those rules don't apply when it's commercial, but that's absolutely not correct. If you read through the board approved regulations, they do apply. Um, an agency's discretion, uh, discretionary power should be used judiciously and in accordance with the board approved regulations. When regulations are clear and unambiguous, they should not be disregarded. Section 8B, I'll remind, applies to all on-water facilities with no distinction as to whether it is residential or commercial, which again, includes the requirement of only one on-water facility per lot. So next slide. Again, I'll just remind you that in response, the BRA uh, representatives mentioned multiple times that there are rules and regulations for permitting that they must follow and they must apply them equitably across the board. And I would say that I absolutely agree. Next slide. In closing, I'll just... Um, say permits for on-water facilities should only be granted if they comply with BRA regulations. Also, BRA regulations should be applied consistently across the board. We request that you please exercise your oversight role and vote to recall these permits because they are not compliant with BRA regulations and on the grounds of safety. I've added here at the bottom because I did read through the Sunset Staff Report and just to paraphrase, just kind of a resounding message from that report, having straightforward regulations that are applied consistently and equitably across the board will improve public trust, reduce the questioning of decisions made, and decrease grounds for litig litigation. And that is it, next slide. Again, just thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your time today. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. If there are any, uh, if you guys have a moment for a brief summary of the economic, I mean, I'm sorry, not economic, environmental concerns, uh, we have a specialist for that as well. Thank you so much for um, providing information to the board. Um, as a reminder, uh, last board meeting, uh, Ms. French came for public comment and she um, uh, began um, her initial request to the board to 
look at this and uh, we invited her today to provide some more information as a public comment of three minutes really doesn't do just to uh, a group of people who are definitely concerned about um, our regulations and permitting. So at this time from the board, uh, we do have other presentations, but does anybody have a, a quick question for uh, Mrs. French before we continue going on? Uh, we have somebody from um, PD's, um, the Jordan Anderson Ventures also here, and then we will also hear from our BRA staff. So does anybody have any questions for Mrs. French at this time? Cynthia, Cynthia, this is Jim Lattimore, Director Lattimore. I have just a few brief questions. All right, go ahead, Director Lattimore. Uh, Ms. French, first of all, thanks for coming in and appearing before the board. Your presentation has been very informative and I'll keep my questions pretty brief. At one point in your presentation, you mentioned that the cove is not connected to the lake, that there is no circulation of water out of the cove into the lake. Did mm -hmm. I hear you correctly? It's not directly connected to the channel. Yes, that's correct. It, it's a very, very long no wake zone, very long narrow no wake zone to the end of that cove. So it is, um, how long do you say that? It's probably three quarters of a mile to the um, to the main part of the lake. Okay. I don't, I don't mean to be argumentative to you, but I've driven my boat uh, up that cove and find that that it is connected to the lake, so. Well, it's connected Maybe. to the lake, but it's not connected to the main part, the channel, the main part. Yes, ma'am, it, it, it is connected, but that's beside the point. At another place in your presentation, you mentioned that there were, that there were five docks, and on the pictures, the drawings, you showed four docks. Uh, where is the fifth one, can you tell us? Uh, yes, the, if you look back at the slide, that, the slide that's numbered, you'll see there's a fifth dock um, that I mentioned was, it's an, it's an existing dock that was transferred ownership to Jordan Anderson Ventures after the sale of property. So that was an existing two slip dock and that makes, that's five. Okay, so that would be the small dock, I guess, around to the, what would be yeah. the east, further in in the cove. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, Creek. Who do you who do you interpret is responsible to for damage to the docks? Is that is that the operator of a watercraft? In other uh, words, if if I'm going by a dock and and I cause damage to it by my weight, <laughs> am I responsible or is somebody else? Oh no, that's and that's uh, that's the unfortunate thing is that the the operator of the boat is responsible, but mm -hmm. um, when you know uh, authorizing agencies are put in a position to make decisions that um, increase the risk of these types of incidences, whether it be uh, property damage or personal injury or worse, uh, I, I mean. Unfortunately, it is the the um, boat operator that is liable. Thank you very much, Madam Presiding Officer. I have no further questions. Okay, thank you for your questions, Director Lattimore. We will move on to call on Mr. Brett Jordan, representing Jordan Anderson Ventures. Uh, Cynthia, th this is David Savage. I had a question. Uh, oh, also. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Go ahead, Director um, Savage. So you mentioned when you were talking about the three green docks, which are uh, with the condo association, were designed for low traffic. What does that mean? How, what's the difference between the designs? What's the low traffic versus? So, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, an expert or a professional in dock building. This is just what how what I've been advised. I know that that uh, when they designed those boat slips, um, it was the uh, characteristics of the cove, the boat traffic, the amount of traffic, the speed of the boats, all of those things were taken into account when those facilities were designed. And that is um, 
directly from the uh, previous homeowners association president who was responsible for working with the engineers to design those slips. Okay. Um, and then my, my other question was on the lot, you know, it does seem pretty clear if that is the way it reads, you know, one onshore facility per lot. Now there's three for that condo association. Doesn't that apply to you two? Or you said that's, that's viewed as multiple lots. Well, so first of all, um, the condominiums, we're talking about commercial facilities, although the rules apply across the board where you're talking about commercial or residential, but um, they, you know, those were, those condominiums were built in the eighties. These regulations, I'm not sure when that specific regulation was added, but these regulations were updated and approved by the board in 2014. Those facilities were built well before 2014 as were those condos. I think they were built back in the eighties. So um, a lot of these facilities are pre-existing, I, I guess, maybe even prior to. Um, also, they uh, show as, as four separate properties, four separate property IDs if you go to the county. Um, so it, there's no legal description to show how many lots there originally were. I, and, and I found that to be the case on a lot of these lots and facilities when I did an open records request looking at commercial permitting applications since 2014, a lot of the lot descriptions were missing, things like that. And I don't know if that has something to do with the divestiture. I, I assume it, it probably does. But okay. again, that's by the county considered four separate um taxable properties and they only have three facilities. Okay, well, thanks. I can tell you put a lot of effort into it and uh, it does uh, illuminate things, but uh, we appreciate uh, the, the further information. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Director Savage. All right, Mr. Mr. Brett <laughs> Jordan, are you still on? Yes, ma'am, I am. If somebody can mute their phone, that would be very helpful. Good morning. This is Brett Jordan. I'm co-owner of uh, Jordan Anderson Ventures, LLC. Uh, we are uh, a development group that uh, started uh, just a little over a year ago. I'm a 22-year resident of Possum Kingdom. Uh, I've been in the, I do the development uh, around the lake for those years. And, uh, and so with this uh, idea that we came across to envision that uh, Possum Kingdom was running uh, short on uh, uh, boat slips in general, uh, if you'll notice around the lake, there is not any public boat facilities that are available to rent at this time. Uh, same way with the RV park, we had uh, envisioned that the uh, uh, the park would enhance the uh, the community. Uh, we run into uh, by this 22 years of being here, uh, October through April May, uh, this lake has been pretty much a ghost town over the years, and so we felt that. Uh, with this concept and vision that we would be able to enhance the uh, uh, the community uh, through those lean years, I mean lean months, excuse me, and that uh, there's many businesses that uh, have to shut their doors because of the seasonal factor that goes along here. And uh, so if you're bringing X number of people into the community, at uh, any given time year round, then you have a better chance of more money being spent, uh, other merchants staying open, uh, being profitable, and just, you know, developing the lake itself uh, to something that we all can be proud of. And uh, I take a little offense to Mrs. French's comment about the, uh, by not being a neighbor, uh, like I said, I've been here 22 years and, I, and I've seen the good, bad, and ugly of what goes on out here. 
and that we had met with Mrs. French uh, early on in the project to discuss her concerns. And uh, so with that, we, we kept that in mind. And then as we started making applications uh, for the, uh, for the uh, dock permitting uh, and our septic system for the, uh, the RV park, those concerns were in mind with that. And so with that, it has taken us literally over a year to get all these permits in place. And uh, the amount of money that has been spent on these docks in this project uh, has been delayed because of um, additional uh, reviews, application, uh, process of going through these uh, applications checks and double checks have been made uh, from the BRA down to uh, the TCEQ. And so we have done nothing but follow the rules and regulations that they have presented to us. And so uh, with that, we feel that all the checks and double checks through the county, through the BRA, through the state, uh, Everybody has gotten comfortable with that, and thus that we have been awarded those permits. Uh, Mr. Jones, uh, let me show you the project. This is the entryway going into PD's RV Resort. That is on the seven and a quarter acres uh, that three of those boat slips, boat docks will be setting on. Uh, that's the welcome center you see under construction right there to your left. Uh, thus, then it goes through uh, the seven and a half acres with 82 boat slips. Next slide, please. This is an aerial of the seven and a quarter acres. As you can see, you can see the, uh, the shoreline, there's over 900 feet of shoreline that runs that particular track. Uh, with that, uh, we've only applied for three um, individual dock units to go on that uh, particular partial. Uh, as you can see, it also sets in the, um, where Park Road 36 and FM 2353, which is the main thoroughfare to the peninsula, uh, where all the activity uh, comes and goes that, uh, the merchants of this area will benefit from. Uh, one, from a convenience factor that you can go get uh, your groceries, your auto parts, your restaurants. Uh, so it uh, it's, it's very well centralized. Uh, this piece of property set vacant for over 30 years. Uh, and so with that vision that we had, we thought this would uh, enhance the community and uh, put something back to the community that has been lacking over the years. Next slide, please. Here's another um, picture of the, uh, of the aerial of the property and of the cove. As you can see, this cove as you get to the main body of water in your top right, uh, is an exception. It's it's wide. It's over 300 feet wide. It's got plenty of uh, access, obviously, for those other docks next door to us. Uh, thus, you come to the back of the cove, uh, where we have uh, permitted our uh, on-site facilities. Um, so any traffic. Uh, that has been commented about is no more than what is in that whole cove that's leading out uh, on a no wake zone to the main part of to the main body of water. Next slide, please. That's uh, that's a pool that we'll be uh, putting in behind the welcome center. Uh, uh, she made a comment on that we will not allow anybody to swim in that cove, which is, uh, that comment has never even been spoken about. Uh, 
yes, we will allow people to go swim in that cove. We will allow people to uh, dock their uh, sea dews at night along that shoreline. It'll be a play playground shoreline also. But we do have these pools. We have two pools that are going into this to this uh, RV park, and uh, uh, we just feel that it just added another amenity to uh, to the family atmosphere. Next slide, please. Yes, you you have seen this aerial uh, already from Mrs. French presentation, uh, and if you kind of think back on the visual you did. Uh, we just showed you of the cove going out. Uh, there is exceptional amount of room between these docks as guideline by the BRA. And uh, so, you know, as far as the hazards concerned, I, you know, that I don't know where she comes up with that term, but uh, it's uh, uh, we're all about safety and concern because we have customers and with those customers, you have to make sure that they're repeat customers. Next slide, please. Well, wait, 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 wait. If you'll notice in that middle part of the top portion of that slide, you know, you've got condos just to the left there, commercial, and then you see Mrs. French's house. So she is only, has the only house within that cove and even going out until you go another Oh, eight or 900 feet past our dock, uh, our permitting docks. So that that house right there is the only one that is in um, of her that she has concerns about. Next slide, please. Excuse me, sir, this is the last of your slides. So that, uh, that gives you an overview of the docks. The docks are, are engineered. Um, by uh, U.S. Docs, who has been in this community now for 15 years, uh, very reputable uh, dock manufacturer. Uh, he relies on the engineering of those docks from a licensed engineer. And so with that, the quality and sound of those docks are second to none. Um, so if y'all have any questions, please feel free to let me know. and. Uh, Thank you for your time. Yes. Um, you mentioned early on that these uh, boat slips will be um, for public, general public use. It's not just for the people in the RV park, or will it be for people in the RV park only? It's, it's public. It will be public. Uh, use for anybody that wants to lease out of a, uh, a slip. Um, the RV park itself, you know, usually they'll have to rent boats uh, if they get on because they they're already maxed out on their trailers when they when they uh, come to the park and in, in their lengths. So this is not designed for the park; it's designed for the public. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, it's difficult for me to tell on the screen who all has a question. Um, this is Director Lattimore. I've got just a couple of quick questions. Thank you. Director Lattimore, go ahead. Um, Mr. Jordan, thank you very much for coming and making your presentation this morning. Um, I just have a few brief questions. Um, do you have, in the future, do you have any plans to build additional docks or is this the total that you'd ever expect to build? No, we don't have any future plans for any docks. We think okay. this is uh, sufficient for what uh, uh, what our vision is uh, in the future. And uh, so this is uh, uh, this is all we we feel that we uh, will will be designed with. Okay. And the and since U.S. docks. Is since U.S. Docs is building them, I assume that these docks are being constructed to BRA standards with en encapsulated flotation and all the other requirements. Yes, sir, they are. 
they they meet all the full regulations that the BRA <laughs> and the standards that they have set. Okay. Uh, what kinds of RVs do you expect, and is there a limitation on the length of stay that you would that you would impose on the RV owners? Our length of stay is is right now at two weeks. Uh, we don't foresee any uh, full timers uh, as the other RV parks around the lake have. Uh, we don't want to turn this to turn into a community. We want this to be in and out people that uh, come and enjoy the lake that have never seen it before. It's uh, we want PK to be a destination. Uh, that has never seen before. Uh, you know, you talk about snowbirds and the snowbirds that come down from the north. Well, PK has never had those before because they haven't had the facilities to to uh, to come into this area. Uh, the bulk of our slips are at 60 feet uh, of concrete. We're going to have concrete roads, concrete pads, uh, fully landscaped, first class. Uh, amenities and uh, and with that you know you're going to have upper scale uh, uh, RV uh, renters that uh, will come and enjoy the lake and everything else that's surrounding within our community. Last, last question and, and this may not be one that you can answer just off the cuff but um, we are particularly concerned at the BRA about water quality, and there are two issues associated with the development of this kind. One of them is, is uh, the potential contamination of the water due to your septic system, and the other is potential contamination due to stormwater runoff. Can you comment about what you're doing to protect the lake on those two subjects? On the, uh, on the, the sewer treatment facility, it has been engineered and reviewed by not only the BRA, a, uh, an independent agency uh, or engineering of, uh, <laughs> that y'all have hired to review this process, uh, along with the review that came from the TCEQ. Uh, with with the, the location of our septic field, which is no, 800 feet, from the water surface itself. Uh, through the engineering of that, everybody is comfortable with the uh, with the facility and don't expect any any problems in the future. Water run runoff is very minimal. Uh, that comes uh, uh, through a lower part part of our uh, park that gets into the lake, just like any other runoff uh, or any other community that has. Uh, you know, everything flows to the lake. And so uh, with that, we're no, we're no exception. And, uh, and we have taken those measures uh, through the engineering of this park to, uh, to make sure everything uh, flows in the manner that it's designed. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Presiding Officer, I don't think I have any other questions. Mr. Jordan. Um, just another question in regards to um, the boat slips. Uh, you talked about public use and leasing options. What is the length of stay for somebody to rent a slip? We, we lease those in one year contracts. Okay. So it's very possible that you won't have the turnaround of every weekend 48 or, uh, you know, uh, different people using those slips. Is that correct? That is correct. You know, through, through watching other marinas and evaluating them, uh, you take the harbor as an example. They have far more uh, docks in place than we do. And the boat traffic on any given weekend, even the major holiday weekends, is very minimal. You know, you just don't have 48 people that show up at one time and go get in their boat and, you know, have to have a traffic cop out there to take care of it. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Mrs. French, yes. do you have your hand up? I do. Okay. I do. 
Um, just a couple of things. Um, to that point, the harbor is 40 to 50 feet deep. The harbor can accommodate even the largest vessels. So it's a bit different. And actually the harbor, those uh, PK Marina docks were the only ones I could find that were even similar since 2014 um, that had been approved for, for public use that were not condominiums for um, more facilities on a single lot. Um, but um, Mr. Jordan, we are not, listen, we, we're not trying to squash Mr. Jordan's vision, okay? That's not the point. No one's trying to stop his RV park. No one is trying to stop him from having, you know, his right to apply for an on-water facility. That, that is not the point. We just want him to follow the rules. We just want the county to follow the rules and the BRA to follow the rules when permitting these facilities. Rules are put in place to the benefit and you know safety benefit of everyone. And those rules should be followed and not disregarded. Um, I think that's very important to, to note. I mean, I mean, my first visit to Possum Kingdom was at an RV park. It's, it's not about putting a stop to it. It's about following the rules. As far as hazards, um, we've lived in that cove for, uh, gosh, I've been coming out to that cove since 2004. We're very aware of where the hazards are and where they're not. Um, and we've seen visitors to that cove come in and ruin their props. And, you know, I own a business right down the road that replaces props. But, you know, so you'd think, hey, why is that a problem for you? It's a problem because this is our home. And frankly, to put those large structures and that many additional boats at the end of this cove is absolutely unreasonable. Um, I, that is my house. Um, it, it is not the only house. It is the only single residential home. But there are... Uh, you know, 34 families <laughs> in the condominiums, and then just to the left of those condominiums, there are additional homes. There were also retirees in Silent Waters Mobile uh, Manufactured Home Park that have been displaced as well. So um, I also want to point out that I too have a very long shoreline, as you can see. If you see my home, you see the edge there, and my shoreline goes all the way almost to the edge of the condominium. Uh, Willis Condominium Complex. Uh, early on, we actually asked the BRA about adding a small swim platform up right behind our house where, you know, it's extremely shallow. And we were told under no, you know, uncertain terms, absolutely not. There is only one on-water facility allowed per shoreline lot. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point. Now, to Mr. Lattimore's question and concerns about runoff and effluent, um, Mr. Jordan said that there will be minimal runoff. That is not correct. By his own engineer's calculations, and we have that deck to show you the picture, the amount of runoff, the volume of runoff actually doubles. And there um, is no remediation plan um, you know, no environmental remediation plan for um, decontaminating that whatsoever before it runs directly into the lake. And we can show you that. And that's their own engineer's work, if, you, if anyone's interested in seeing that. That's, that's all. Unless someone else has questions, thank but thank you. you. Thank you very much. Are there any other directors that have a question? All right. Seeing none, were there any other um, members of the public that wanted to speak on this agenda item before we move forward? All right, I don't see any. Hi, hi. Um, oh. so my name is Shannon Willingham, I believe. Um, you received my slides um, as Carrie French spoke about the um, runoff. I'm not sure if we have time to briefly discuss that and our concerns with that. Um, but if we 
we do, I would like to discuss. Okay, so tell us your name again and give us your address, please. My name is, so my name is Shannon Willingham. Um, I, I live at um, currently 433 Commonwealth Drive in Fort Worth, Texas, but have um, visited Possum Kingdom um, almost my whole life now. Um, I, I did have a deck of slides. Did you have those? They were provided to you, I believe. Uh, I think it was, think it like, was like four or five slides. Uh, yes, this is Lisa. Um, I received those, but I received those by uh, Miss French, not uh, yes, you. Yes, those, those, she went ahead and sent them in for me. Okay, uh, Director Flores, would you like for me to pull those up? Sure. So is what we're about to see part of the board packet that we saw before, or is this brand new? I'm sorry, Director Henderson, I did not hear your question, if that was you. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, that is me. Have we got a copy of the slides that are, are about to be pulled up? Were they part of the packet, or is this something brand new? Lisa, were these loaded and diligent? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, late yeah, Friday. Yeah. Okay. okay. Director Huber, I got them. Okay. They were in my package. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and begin if that's okay. Um, so I just want to briefly discuss, um, and I'll try to make it very brief. I know. Um, uh, y'all's you time is very valuable, but um, discuss stormwater runoff and potential contaminants. Uh, I want to preface this information by saying that we do understand that runoff concern, uh, occurs around the lake um, and it contributes to lake levels. However, um, the potential for runoff contamination and accumulation of these contaminants in this cove is, is a, a big cause for concern. Um, if you could go to the first slide, please. Um, and I'm not sure if you're able to play that video, um, but that is actually a video there on the right. Um, it'll allow you to play. It looks like it might. You can hit, uh, if you could start it over and hit play, you may have to. Um, but as you can see, we've already witnessed a large amount of runoff from this property containing immense loads of sediment. Um, this is a result of the entire property having been dis disturbed and all of the vegetation removed. Uh, we're concerned with the existing amount of runoff and what can be expected to occur after the proposed pavement and other impervious surfaces are added. Um, looking at the plans for this site, it's evident that there will be uh, not a lot of room left for vegetation growth. So it's mainly going to be, you know, RV pads, roads, um, swimming pools, sidewalks. Um, so, you know, we're worried about where we'll be able to have any kind of vegetation or any kind of filtration of this runoff. So, um, you know, established vegetation allows for increased saturation for adequate runoff filtration um, as it did on site before this com this property was completely disturbed. Um, so we're just worried about any kind of filtration of this runoff that, um, you know, won't be occurring um, uh, after during operation. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so these are photos uh, before photos. So obviously you can see the cove, you can see the vegetation that was on site. Um, if you could go to after, to, to the next slide. So, um, and obviously this is during construction and um, we are aware that they do have a stormwater permit, but um, for this construction work, but we are concerned, you know, like I said, with the disturbances on site, um, the entire property has been disturbed and the entire property would, will be developed. Um, so with the runoff that we, you know, expect to see. And if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so during a review of documents that were provided to us by the by Palo Pinto County following an open records request, we found a drainage plan for the site. 
Um, this drainage plan shows topographical changes that are to be implemented or have already possibly been implement, implemented with all of the um, dirt work that they've done on site. These topographical changes combined with the impervious surfaces on site have actually increased the amount of runoff and even directed water that once ran off of the adjacent FM highway um, into the ditch away from the lake, um, now into directly into the lake. Um, uh, so if you could go to the next slide, I can show you. So this is the drainage plan that we um, received from the county while doing an open records request of the site. Um, on the right hand side, you have 20, FM 2353 pre-developed. Um, as you can see the contour lines, the water did move um, away from the road. Now it actually moves off of the road um, and directly into the lake. Um, uh, the, the drainage plan also shows that the development will almost double the um, peak runoff rate of the site. And in the area where the septic drain field will be located. Um, so pre-developed, you know, this plan, and you can't see all of the, the calculations at the bottom, um, but shows the pre-developed on site A to be a peak runoff rate increase from 3.28 cubic feet per second to 5.71 cubic feet per second. And then on B, we're actually, um, and you can see on here is where their drain fold is located, um, the peak runoff rate increasing from 6.54 cubic feet per second to 11.39 cubic feet per second. So, um, and then to, <clears throat> Lastly, to my point about the impervious previous surfaces, this drainage plan also shows that um, 100 and you know almost half of the area of the site will be impervious. So 151,207 square feet of impervious property uh, versus 165, 213 square feet of of pervious um, property. Which, like I said, um, given the the plan and where all of the um, you know RV pads and roads will be um, we believe that will be you know minimal vegetation there so um, if you could go to the next slide please um, again <clears throat> I just want to say that our concerns are with the potential contaminants that will now have an increased uh, risk of accumulating in the cove um, and this is the video again as you can see in that video, one contaminant that is already leaving the property and entering the cove is sediment. Sedimentation of this already small shallow cove over time can be detrimental to this area of the lake. Um, another contaminant of concern is the effluent from the septic system on site that I've mentioned um, that has potential to travel with runoff over and under these impervious surfaces on site and directly into the lake. You know, as seen on um, Lake Granberry and noted on the BRA, BRA website, I believe Mr. Latimer actually mentioned it, um, uh, you know, those commercial septic systems can greatly affect small shallow coves and require surface water remediation and, and potential watershed programs. Um, lastly, we're concerned with the potential for runoff of contaminants produced by vehicles and road traffic, such as heavy metals, antifreeze, engine oil. Um, we're concerned with RV chemicals that are typically added to RV septic tanks or that can leak or spill from use on site, and also any pesticide or herbicides that are used on site. Um, again, as shown by the drainage plan that, that I showed, uh, what's been witnessed on site um, and what has been witnessed on site, these contaminants can and will leave the property with stormwater runoff um, and enter the lake. You know, although things of this nature um, tend to be under the jurisdiction of TCEQ, um, TCEQ will not act on the issue until the cove is already contaminated. Mm -hmm. um, so we ask that the BRA, you know, please take our concerns into consideration um, before we begin to see similar uh, issues to those at Granberry Lake. Uh, we are aware that, um, you know, BRA will begin taking water quality samples from this area. We are extremely grateful for this, um, but we do ask that someone please act um, to establish some kind of management practices on site um, to prevent the contamination of this cove.
All right. Thank you very much for your comments. Is there anyone else from the public online wishing to speak on this agenda item? Seeing none, we will now hear a presentation from Mike McClendon from uh, the BRA Upper Basin Regional Manager. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Prasadi Officer Flores, uh, members of the board. Uh, you you all have heard from uh, individuals that are uh, uh, that have, I guess spoken in opposition to the development, uh, and uh, then those comments were clarified a little bit by Mrs. French. And uh, you've also heard from the the developer, uh, Mr. Brett Jordan. Uh, this presentation was prepared to explain what steps the VRA undertook during the permitting process. And uh, as you know, and as you've heard, there's uh, two aspects with this development that the Brazos River Authority permits, uh, the on-site sewage facility and also the on-water facilities. And then uh, with this permit or with this uh, uh, presentation, I also estimated uh, kind of the issues that may have been brought about based upon uh, the discussions that we've had over the last several months uh, with uh, individuals. So uh, as you've seen, uh, there's been some photographs of uh, Willow Beach Slough, uh, and uh, my understanding is that the developer obtained the tracks 3A, 2A, and 2B from uh, Michael Patterson with a PK Land Park Partnership, uh, of which he acquired those properties during the PK divestiture process. And so uh, as you've seen, uh, get my highlighter real quick, um, the area that's being developed is for PD's RV park is track 3A and it's here's approximately the outline here and it's about 7.2 acres and then my understanding uh, that the developer also acquired what was referred to as silent waters and that's uh, about two and a half acres uh, I believe there are some sub lessees that uh, still are on that property and I'm not sure or not but uh, there's another two acres up here that uh, I believe the developer also acquired, but that's not part of the proposed development. And y'all have heard Mrs. French and some refer to her house in the cove. Uh, this is the location of her house. And then there's a little area, it's a drainage area uh, that's in between these properties. And uh, our review found that uh, a firm uh, known as Paltex Partners uh, owns that drainage area. Uh, they have a lot of mineral interest uh, around the lake. So this slide right here is to try to illustrate the time frame uh, and the steps to permit the uh, on-site sewage facility. Uh, you'll notice looking through this that the, the design was changed multiple times by the developer. Uh, he submitted the uh, application, uh, the design, and uh, withdrew it and then resubmitted it. Ultimately, <clears throat> uh, uh, as was stated earlier, a, an engineer provided uh, that application to us. Then our internal BRA office reviewed it uh, as you heard, we also submitted that application to the TCQ, uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, which oversees uh, the on-site sewage facility programs in the state of Texas. And uh, they reviewed it, uh, provided their comments. Uh, and then, uh, as you also heard, uh, the BRA uh, obtained a third-party engineer uh, to review uh, the application. Ultimately, uh, as you heard, uh, in February 2021, uh, we did issue uh, an authorization to proceed. Uh, and as uh, you've also heard uh, during the uh, process of the per permitting process, uh, we responded to approximately 22, 23 open records requests. Uh, we went, met with uh, Mr. French. Uh, we responded to numerous emails, phone calls, uh, voicemails, etc. Uh, and one of the things that uh, got brought up here. Uh, as well was the, the developer uh, had also agreed to some testing requirements and some reporting requirements that are beyond uh, state standards and also uh, beyond any kind of BRA requirements. So he's got some things that he's agreed to above and beyond uh, what's required by the state. With this slide, it's uh, to show you kind of uh, the timeline for the DOC application process. Um, it, it's been asserted that uh, we don't have a process wherein a neighbor uh, can protest uh, another neighbor's on-site sewage facility or 
uh, doc application, and, and that's correct. Uh, if we did, almost every application would uh, have a complaint. Uh, we see it all the time. Uh, they don't like the color, they don't like the style, they don't like the location, the size, the material, uh, et cetera. Uh, but what we do have is a ba basic set of rules and regulations that we review and consider. And uh, after we uh, reviewed the placement of these on-water facilities, uh, we factored in the uh, requested number of slips. We factored in the bathymetric data that you heard. Uh, we understand the proximity of these facilities to existing facilities that are uh, existing and also uh, those that are permitted. Uh, we also uh, understand that uh, there's a no wake restriction within that uh, SLU. And then we applied the institutional knowledge of our inspectors that have been there for decades. Uh, and a determination was made to issue a permit to construct the proposed facilities. Uh, and that was uh, provided to uh, the applicant in uh, January 2021. Uh, you've seen this slide here. Uh, this is uh, an image uh, that just shows you a small part of the BRE field work that goes into uh, the process whenever we're looking at proposed facilities. So we look at the issues like distances to existing docks, planned docks, uh, and shorelines. Uh, one of the claims that has been brought up is uh, uh, that the BRA is violating uh, some of our rules, particularly the one dock per lot. Uh, the administration and enforcement of one dock per lot has been applied to residential and commercial properties alike, uh, and that is the standard. Uh, however, for commercials, as was uh, reflected, <clears throat> the review has always been on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and that's also stated in our rules and re regulations. Uh, regardless of which version uh, you're looking at, uh, whether it's the updated BRA rules that uh, took place in 2014. Uh, one of the things that I wanted you to note uh, was that since 2014, whenever the rules were updated, uh, we've had uh, 14 commercial applications. On uh, all 14 of those commercial applications, there has been more than one dock per lot. Uh, and also uh, the Willow Beach uh, condominiums were reflected, uh, shown here. And uh, that too uh, is uh, considered a commercial facility uh, in order to permit those docks. And they have three, uh, three docks associated with one, one, one strip. And, you know, Mrs. French, it, it may have changed uh, or at some point uh, uh, with regard to on the tax rolls as four, uh, but I'm not aware of that. Uh, one of the issues that's been brought up uh, several times, and it's very important to the Brazos River Authority is safety. And so <clears throat> what I wanted to show on this was a comparison of Willow Beach Slough. You've got Willow Beach Slough here. Here's the area that is of concern, but here's a, a greater picture showing the slough. And then I wanted to show some commercial developments uh, that were mentioned. Um, uh, you've got the Sportsman's World. Uh, so here's the Sportsman's World and here's their cove. Uh, and then you've got the cliffs and here's their, clove, their cove or slough. And uh, uh, there's just not any kind of hard data uh, that's going to suggest that uh, Willow Beach Slough is going to be any more dangerous uh, or, or any more of a hazard uh, than these uh, existing uh, facilities. Uh, the BRA does have five lake rangers uh, that are on patrol. And uh, also on uh, holiday weekends, uh, you'll also see uh, at least that number of uh, game wardens that are out on the waters too uh, patrolling. Uh, this is another slide just to kind of uh, Compare uh, Willow Beach Slough again down here at the bottom, showing you the development, uh, the PD's development down here at the lower right. And then you've got uh, Fox Hollow, uh, a commercial development up here. This is their slough or their cove. And then the harbor was referenced. And uh, also here's uh, a photograph of their slough. Of their slough. And, and again, uh, there's just not any kind of hard data that's going to suggest uh, Willow Beach Slough is any more of a hazard than these uh, existing commercial developments. And then this is my last slide. Uh, obviously, it's not to scale. Uh, this is really just an approximation <coughs> and a, a slide that we produce to kind of illustrate of what we think the SLU will look like uh, when the on-water facilities are, are, are installed compared to the existing facilities. Um, you know, uh, we did listen to the, to the public. Uh, we do take safety uh, concerns uh, very seriously. Uh, this project was discussed in earnest. It was reviewed. Uh, pretty significantly, probably uh, more significantly than any other. Uh, uh, the developer has agreed to uh, specific metering and testing uh, that's above and beyond state standards. Uh, 
uh, as you also heard, uh, our general manager, uh, CEO, David, has committed to uh, uh, some water quality monitoring initiatives that are going to be not just at Possum Kingdom, but uh, throughout many of our reservoirs. Uh, and uh, that's planned to go into effect here in June within this sloop. So uh, in addition to uh, the, the data that uh, our Environmental Services Division collects now, uh, we're going to have some more data and it'll include this sloop. So uh, this really concludes, uh, well, I guess as you've heard, uh, we, the BRI Business River Authority, has uh, issued both the on-site sewage facility permit uh, and uh, we've also issued the uh, on-water facility permits. And this completes my, uh, my presentation and I can answer you know, any questions that uh, uh, any of the members might have. Thank you for your presentation. Just real quick on the permit, Mrs. French referred to 12 plus acres. And so oh. it's the 7.26 plus the 2.5 that you pointed out plus an additional two. So all of that is roughly the 12 acres. And in reference to what she's talking about, the seven point. Yes, that would, that would be my that would be my estimate. That's where I think that number came from. OK, all right. Uh, I think I saw Director Henderson's hand go up first. So, Director Henderson. Thank you, Chairwoman Flores. I appreciate that. Um, Mike, I have a couple of quick questions for you. Um, this is something that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and by by that, I mean land development and ensuring that the health, safety, and well-being of the general public is intact. I don't see an issue here. Um, do you, do you think that any staff member at the VRA saw a health, safety, or well-being issue with issuing the permit? No, I mean that that's why. I mean, uh, you saw the timeline uh, that it took a while uh, to go through the process. It's it's not uh, just you know one day or a two week turnaround. Uh, it, it's very uh, exhaustive in discussions. I think there was an email up there early on too that kind of asked for the thoughts and someone claimed there wasn't a response. Well, the people are in the office next door and I think it's just getting out there. Hey, here's some information. Here's what I understand is going on. And all four of those individuals got together and collaborated and discussed it. And uh, if there were concerns, we would have never issued the permits or we would have gone back <clears throat> and asked for some kind of modification uh, thereof. Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm on board with you and, and I'll be honest, I, I'm at the other end of, of having to obtain permits from other municipalities and, and jurisdictions and the timeline that, that you guys reviewed and approved in is, is to be commended. I, I thought you did a really fast job and a great job with it. Um, and so part of that review, did you guys look at the erosion and sedimentation controls and and make sure that that, that runoff is going to be acceptable during the construction and then after as well? Yeah, well, uh, there's kind of juris jurisdictional boundaries that are intersecting right there that was kind of brought up. Uh, <clears throat> they The developer does have to have a stormwater pollution prevention plan, and uh, the developer does have that. Uh, that was the blue silt fence that you could see that was meant to keep erosion from and sediment from uh, reaching the reservoir. Uh, I know there have been a lot of rain. There's some, uh, and uh, I don't know what the TCQ standards are anymore, but if it rains a certain amount, uh, there is some, <clears throat> I guess, uh, there's, there's not recourse for some of the actions if there is sedimentation runoff, if there's a significant amount of rain. However, they are supposed to maintain those, uh, those facilities to ensure uh, and then part of the development process uh, with regard to in the future uh, about runoff ratios and stuff, that would be more with the county and the, the county would, uh, if they had any kind of uh, subdivision rules or uh, ordinances uh, that required a, a certain amount uh, adjacent to a reservoir or anywhere, any kind of development, that would fall under the uh, county rules and regulations. Right. Can I correct one thing you just said? So sure. you said that you weren't sure if there was much recourse for um, the sediment control. And what I've seen um, in being a civil engineer for 15 years is that the recourse is in fines and then cleaning up the mess as well. And so that would come from one of the jurisdictions that that reviews and approves. And if I understand this right, 
there's probably more than one jurisdiction outside of the VRA who's had to approve this as well. Is that your understanding of this same area? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So let, let me clarify my comment too with regard to the not uh, being a recourse. That, that's if uh, there's a significant amount of rain and it exceeds the uh, rainfall amount uh, for that stormwater permit. Yeah, no, most definitely the TCQ would probably issue NOVs and yes, there are fines and remediation activities that they could impose. So yes, and then there's other uh, entities that uh, review this. Uh, the county uh, reviewed that, uh, the, the development as well. And so there's an opportunity there for citizens to uh, become engaged in that process. And as far as you know, did they all approve this? Yes, they have. Oh, awesome. Okay. One of the comments that I heard earlier was that the, the OSSF could possibly contaminate the lake. Can you speak to that? Um, is that possible? Uh, yeah, anything's possible. I mean, uh, it's there was an engineer designed it. Uh, stamped and sealed it. Uh, the BRA reviewed it. Uh, the TCQ reviewed it. Uh, BRA hired another engineer to review it. And based upon the drawings and the submittal and the engineer design, we believe that it will function. Of course, you know, there's another component or two or three more after that. You've got to uh, then construct it right and then you have to operate it and maintain it. So uh, the developer uh, seems very interested in. Uh, uh, within the community up at Possum Kingdom. So uh, it gives me a lot more comfort when someone is around and that's still in the, the area that they're going to make sure everything's done correctly. I, I appreciate that. I guess my, my only comment is that um, what what are we trying to do with this this item? It looks like the only thing that we can do is have possible action. What are those possible actions that we can make on this item? Director Henderson, um, if uh -huh. I may just briefly, um, going back a little history, last board meeting, um, Mrs. French spoke three minutes in public comment about the um, her concerns about this project. And um, we felt like it would be a good idea to ask her to come to the board and give some history and uh, educate the board on what what she was seeing out there as well as the um, PD's RV uh, giving them an opportunity to talk about the project and then more importantly for the BRA and Mike McClendon and his team to talk to us about the project and what all has been um, transpiring so and today, obviously, is a, an education to the board. Um, we do have it listed as a possible action. Um, but it, at this point, um, you know, we're getting comments from them and we're giving the opportunity for the board to learn more about the project. OK, I appreciate that. Yep. And then I see uh, Director Lattimore has his hand up. Director Lattimore, do you hear me? <laughs> Sorry, I was still muted. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking away. Uh, Mike, Mike, I have just a few brief questions. Uh, isn't it isn't it true that that uh, every facility, uh, be they residential or commercial, or around the lake? depends on either a dedicated uh, wastewater treatment facility or a septic system? Yes. So there, there is no, there is no, there's nothing unusual about what Petey's is talking about doing. Um, and to, in, in your opinion, with the additional testing that, that the BRA is gonna be performing, are there adequate safeguards in place if if this system should fail? Uh, I believe so. I mean, it'll be noticed. I mean, uh, if we go through, uh, if uh, our environmental services department goes through here in June, uh, start collecting some background data, so you'll get some history on what the cove looks like right now. 
uh, you've got the developer already, as I stated earlier, uh, doing some testing and uh, sampling uh, events beyond what's uh, uh, required. Uh, he'll be looking also at, uh, there's a, I don't want to get too far down in the weeds, but uh, once it hits over 5,000 gallons per day, uh, that's kind of a trigger point of whether or not you can use an on-site sewage facility or uh, you have to build like a package plant or a wastewater treatment plant, you know, that right. most people are more familiar with. Uh, so he's going to be monitoring uh, his gallons per day per use and reporting that. And so if he starts noticing an uptick, he's going to take some measures, you know, to, to try to reduce that to where it won't become an issue. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, one other one other question. There was some conversation about about stormwater runoff. And uh, as a matter of fact, what we're really talking about is the time of concentration of that runoff. The, the, there really isn't any additional water being created, I suppose a small amount over by 2353, but that ultimately would have come in the lake anyway. Uh, so it, we're not talking about radical changes as far as stormwater runoff is concerned, are we? No, uh, but, uh, you know, to the point, uh, we, we want to limit uh, any kind of sedimentation loads into the reservoir. Uh, perfect, and, perfect. Uh, uh, you know, it looks like uh, they're uh, trying to uh, to do that with that sedimentation or with that silt fencing. Uh, my understanding is uh, there was a complaint and uh, TCQ was supposed to come out around May 20th, uh, whether or not they followed up and uh, came out and looked at the uh, site or issued any kind of letter or discussion, uh, but my understanding was uh, there was a complaint and TCQ uh, did come out. I can I can I can confirm what uh, Director Henderson was saying. Uh, in my experience, TCEQs move slowly, but they they do have the ability not only for fines, but uh, can cause cleanup uh, in sedimentation issues and most any other kind of pollution. Uh, Madam Chair, I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other board members that have questions for Mike McClendon? Madam Chair, this is Director Tallis, I do. All right, Director Tallis. Mike, can you comment about Mrs. French's uh, maybe perception that uh, rules, policies, procedures have been uh, inappropriately applied or not necessarily applied the same for this situation as has been in the past? Yeah, uh, I do not believe so. That, I mean, the, the one about the one dock per lot, uh, you know, I, I went through that during my presentation briefly and uh, I may have, uh, you know, went through it a little bit quick, but uh, yeah, the, the standard is, you know, one dock per lot. Uh, and that, that's how it's written. And uh, but uh, as I also mentioned, uh, we've had 14 commercial applications since 2014, and uh, all 14 of those have more than one dock uh, per lot. And uh, th that's how that's been applied. Uh, could the language be a little bit more clear? Yeah, I'm not going to disagree. Uh, you know, it probably could. Uh, but that's how we've applied. And that's how uh, we've uh, treated everybody around the lake. And, uh, you know, going to some of the points where uh, we've made where try to treat everybody fairly and equitably, that, that's our goal is uh, uh, to treat everybody the same. I'd, I'd like for our legal department to chime in and talk about that exception to that rule and how that's applied. Laura Lee, can you do that, please? Yes, I can. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, with regard to the rules, there is a specific provision um, in the rules that addresses commercial on-water facilities. And with regard to the commercial facilities, the language articulates that we look at those on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think Mike has that somewhere maybe in his slides. But regardless, that's, that's what's what inspired. It should be reflected right now, if y'all can see that. Yeah. Due to the unique, unique nature of the commercial on water facilities, such facilities shall be evaluated on a case by case basis. And we reserve the right to establish restrictions, limitations, and requirements. So, one, we evaluate them on a case by case basis. And secondarily, we reserve the right to establish appropriate restrictions, limitations, and requirements. Thank you. All right. I see um, Director <coughs> Sanderson has a question. 
Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate it. A um, couple of things. Uh, with respect to the slide before, I gather that um, an item E2 that is either not applicable or has been taken into consideration. Yes, it, it was designed by an engineer. Item E2. Item E2. Oh, E2. Uh, of course, of course. Uh, I don't think that's uh, an issue associated with that. Uh, I know Ken Edwards, our inspector, is on the line. I I'd have to ask him. Uh, I don't think that is an issue associated with this. So it's either non-applicable or has been addressed. OK, correct. All right, very good. Um, there were three, um, two or three other um, commercial uh, facilities that were shown on another slide. I think one was Sportsman's uh, World and the Cliffs, yeah. All the um, all of the um, facilities that we're talking about here have been evaluated and uh, addressed on a similar process as this one has been. Is that correct? Yes, sir. TCEQ was, was asked, was to, asked to, um, well, to chime in as applicable and so forth and so on, or what other the but, regulatory entities or associated with it have been invited and had an opportunity to um, make um, whatever um, input they is appropriate. Is that correct? Yeah, that'd be correct. Uh, the on-water facilities uh, would be strictly uh, the Brazos River Authority's permitting process. Uh, right, sure. And sure. there might be some Corps of Engineer uh, process involved, uh, you know, depending upon the disturbance in the lake bed. And then uh, at one point, uh, whenever we were under FERC, uh, many of these uh, uh, developments also had to undergo, uh, we had to submit this uh, to FERC for their approval as well. So there were some other agencies uh, at the time. Are there awesome. any? Uh, are there any um, procedurally? Are there any um, items in the process that we followed here that someone could say, "Well, we didn't follow this process," or something wasn't equitably or fairly applied, or equally applied to other landowners, commercial landowners in the uh, in the area? Yeah. No, no, sir. That that wouldn't be an issue. That's a fair statement. Isn't it? The process Correct. is consistent and fair, and no one has been uh, treated in any manner, shape, or form other than anyone else who has come to the table. That's correct. Okay, good. Um, um, I'm gathering then that we're, and obviously we are satisfied with the engineering, the engineer's reports, any kind of uh, reviews, any kind of independent reviews. There have been no anomalies brought up that haven't been addressed. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so no open items. As as to, as the sedimentation and so forth and so on. That, that was kind of an interesting uh, observation to me. Uh, I, is it fair to say that the sedimentation that's going on is strictly a um, construction process or uh, uh, anomaly? And that that's something that, that at once construction is over with, you wouldn't necessarily see that. You know, I, I don't know what their development uh, looks like and the, you know, there was some information that others had provided about concrete. Obviously, I mean, the more concrete you have, uh, yeah, there's going to be a greater runoff. Uh, but, uh, you know, th that, that's not an issue that uh, the BRA regulates. That's an area that I was referencing earlier that the county would regulate and through their ordinances if they right. wish to do that. Yeah, what I saw was some sedimentation maybe, but a lot of brown dirt. I, thought, I imagine with a little grass on it and some concrete, you wouldn't see as much brown dirt running off, right? So that was my get at. Okay, beyond that, that's all I have. And I thank you very so much. I, I want to make sure that we clarify something here. From Director Sanderson, you made the comment about TCEQ's involvement. TCEQ does not get involved in the permitting of our docks. So going back in history, TCQ's involvement in those would be the same as it was for PDs. However, as the administrator of the TCQ's uh, on-site septic program, that's typically a role that BRA plays without TC, without TCQ. My point being is that there was no process, that no one was um, uh, deprived of any process that they would have had otherwise. Is what that's I was correct. Okay. That's correct. All right, uh, Mrs. French, I saw your hand up. Uh, yes, I have some questions for Mr. McClendon. Um, sure. First of all, just a, a correction. Um, 
Mr. McClendon started his presentation with this property was received by Mr. Patterson as part of the Dumbbell Show, and that is actually incorrect. Um, that property was part of Patterson Constantine. It was owned by Wayland Brooks, and it was purchased. It was a private purchase. Um, so I've spoken with Mr. Brooks mm -hmm. to verify that. Um, the secondly, um, I know th that Mr. McClendon showed photos trying to compare the Willow Beach Slough with others, the cliffs. Uh, I believe he showed Harbor Sportsman's World. And I was wondering if they have any photos of those specific areas when there are low, low lake levels. Uh, our, our permits uh, don't guarantee lake levels. Uh, all on water facility permits uh, don't guarantee, and it's in big bold letters. And so, uh, <laughs> low, lake, lake levels aren't necessarily an issue that's going to decide whether or not a permit is issued or not. Does that factor into safety? Also, the photographs that you were showing was from the, uh, you know, the drought of record 2015, uh, set a new drought of record for uh, Possum Kingdom Reservoir. But uh, I mean, I, I, I suppose it, it, there could be some safety issues associated with it because uh, when the lakes go down, you're gonna have more stumps. Uh, but uh, as I said earlier during my presentation, you know, we factored in uh, probably over 20 or 30 years worth of experience by our inspectors that are familiar with the reservoir. Uh, familiar with the permitting process, and uh, we determined uh, from a safety standpoint that uh, there's no issues. Uh, I mean, there, there's always going to be some kind of issues, but uh, we don't see that it's any more dangerous than anywhere else. Okay. Um, so of the 14 commercial applications that you refer to, um, how many of those how many of those are condominiums? Do you know how many of those are actually public rental slips or public rental on water facilities similar to this? Because I, I looked at that list and, it, and, and uh, it, it looked to me like there weren't very many new facilities. There were a lot of transfers and some movement of existing facilities. And I'm curious also as to how many, do you know if those commercial um, properties or owners, developers, have more than one lake uh, shoreline lot? Um, uh, no, no. You're just, asking just, questions that uh, I'd have to refer to some of our lake staff. Because those, I mean, that, that is the whole point, right, of the, you know, having multiple facilities is not the point, but having multiple facilities on a single shoreline lot is, is the point. And, I, and as I looked, it looked like most of those commercial businesses have multiple lots, according to the county. Um, and then on, on, the, on the septic, you mentioned the third party engineer reviewing the septic plan. And, and we are very grateful for all of the extra efforts that went into evaluating the septic system with TCEQ and, and with BRA. Um, so I have a question. The septic engineer in the letter, the approval letter actually said he approves this this plan, if the elevations on the plan are correct uh, to the actual property. And so I'm wondering who is going to check that since there hasn't been a survey and the, the topography, I mean, the, the landscape, the topography has completely been changed. Who's actually going to verify that the grading and the elevations that he recommended are going to be actually correct to the property because I asked the county and they said in quote well the person that's told me it sure as hell won't be me so I'm just curious who it will be. Yeah the BRA is the permitting authority and so what uh, was submitted uh, the BRA once it's installed will go out and review it. So you're so going to review the elevation survey as well to check those? Just since that was an important well, we'll review that. I, I, I don't do that, what, what you're describing on a daily basis, I, I don't get involved in, but uh, we will review the application, we'll review what is stated by the engineers can be installed, and when we go on site, we'll make sure that it's installed correctly. 
And, and um, Mr. Lattimore um, mentioned some concerns of contaminants specifically, but I know that, you know, he, he, there are going to be some measures of testing for the septic system, but I did want to point out that those are only measuring BOD. So other contaminants, uh, metals, so on and so forth, those will not actually be, um, be, be measured. Uh, there's also um, on the stormwater runoff, just to clarify a couple of things, they, um, they only have a stormwater permit for the construction period. So there's actually no stormwater prevention plan for the operation period. Um, the slides that Shannon uh, Willingham showed earlier, um, they actually show, I think someone said, so there's, I think Mr. Lattimore maybe said that he didn't feel like there would be an increased volume of runoff, but actually the plan shows that there will, but there'll be a marked increase uh, in, in, uh, in runoff. And so that's one of the concerns that no one seems to, neither authorizing agency, the BRA, nor the county has looked at specifically and required some sort of plan. Uh, because when you, when you change the grading and you remove all the vegetation, it absolutely changes the volume of runoff. And I think she went through the specific numbers. And in some cases, it's, it's uh, tw twice what uh, per, per um cubic square feet than, than what it would be with the natural vegetation. Um, also, has this stormwater plan, well, there has there's not an operational stormwater plan, but there was a question of has all of this been approved so far by the county? And the answer to that is actually no. Um, the county has approved their construction, their permit for construction, but they, you know, they will have to have an oc occupancy certificate um, and so maybe some of those things will be addressed at that point. Um, Thank you, Mrs. French, for your comments. We have a couple of more board members that have some questions. So uh, Director Wilson, I saw your hand up. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have a question for Mike. Uh, can you put that slide back up? Uh, that had the our rules on it <clears throat> that Miss Fallon Fallon uh, spoke to. Yes, leave that up for just a minute, please. I got a before I talk about that. I have a question or two. You said uh, in your presentation that uh, for the OSSF that they had uh, PDs had agreed to additional testing and reporting requirements. My question is, who do they report to and who monitors it? Uh, I think the reporting requirements and the, the, the is going to be submitted to the BRA uh, and uh, the testing. Did you say what, what are the testing requirements? Well, I want to know who and who gets the reports. I'm sorry, you, you broke up there. The okay. BRA will get the reports and the BRA will be monitoring the data. Uh, and also as part of the monitoring, uh, the landowner will be doing, uh, the permittee will be doing uh, BOD concentration so we can monitor uh, both water volumes going in and concentration of effluent going in. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, David. Are those self-test or will we be doing the, that testing? Those are self-test. Okay, uh, and if there is a violation, what are the consequences? There were some things, yeah, yeah, there were some things uh, that were uh, he had agreed to, and I, I can't recall exactly off the top of my head, but it's it's like uh, uh, you'll go take another sample, you know, to ensure that that sample wasn't some kind of uh, anomaly. Uh, but then uh, uh, there's some actions, and I think I said, uh, Kent Edwards, are, are you on this call where you could jump in and and kind of elaborate? Yes, he's here. Uh, part of that testing, if um, there was provision that if they go above the uh, the BOD, uh, we would do another test um, in a short term. And if they continue, then they're probably going to get a redesign, uh, possible uh, changing of the system to bring that BOD down.
Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, I, I want to uh, say up front, Michael and rest of the staff, that I think y'all have done a, a, a very thorough job. And I'm not questioning uh, your decision or anything that uh, y'all have done or your review of the permits. But David, Mr. Collinsworth, I would like to look at this because to me, it's very, this rule is very ambiguous. When I read it, and I know I'm not the brightest tack in the box, but when it says that we uh, can have additional requirements, when we can, uh, uh, et cetera, and it's evaluated on a case by case basis, everything I see leans towards restrictions and limitations and extra requirements. If our intent is to be able to make an exception to the rules that we have, I think we might ought to look at maybe clarifying the language that is in this this uh, rule uh, here. It, it would help me a whole lot. Thank you, Director, Director Wilson, Will. for your comment. I saw Director Tallis had a question. No, I answered mine. Mine's done. Any other board members that have questions? Okay, seeing that no other board members have questions, we've heard public comment. Uh, thank you very much to <coughs> Mrs. French, to um, Mr. Brett Jordan, and to Mike McClendon for your presentations on this uh, PD's RV park. At this time, I would like us to take a 15 minute break um, and we'll come back and begin with agenda item number three. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. Um, Lisa, will you mind pull, uh, calling roll to make sure everybody is back on? Presiding Officer Flores? Here. Here. Director Tallis? Here. Here. Director Taylor? Here. Director Abraham? Director Boren? Director Fernandez? Here. Director Henderson? Here. Director Huber? Here. Director Crone? Here. Director Lachance? Here. Director Lattimore? Here. Director Leslie? Here. Director Lloyd? Here. Director Luton? Here. Director Rankin? Here. Director, Director Ruiz? Director Sanderson? Here. Director Savage? Director Smith? Here. Director Wilson? Here. Thank you, Lisa. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I know that was a very lengthy uh, last agenda item, but very important for the entire board um, to hear the concerns of um, the residents around PK and, of course, uh, business owners. <laughs> and um, Director Wilson, I do want to make a comment and just very briefly, you mentioned about the language um, being vague or uh, not very clear. And I would like to ask Laura Lee and her legal department to um, look at that, evaluate that, and uh, bring bring it back to the board to see um, if there's ways that we can clean that language up to be uh, more specific so there are not questions uh, in the future. It, Director Wilson, is that pretty much what you were alluding to in your comments? <clears throat> yes, Madam Chair, that is exactly right. Just for them to look at it and see what their thoughts about it are. Thank you for okay. doing that. All right, very good. Okay, 
Uh, we're going to move on to agenda item number three, discussion and possible action on Texas County and District Retirement System Plans, TCDRS, DRS. Monica Willis, Human Resource Manager. So, uh, Monica. Good morning. Yes. Each year I present the TCDRS proposed employer contribution rate for the next calendar year to the board for consideration. Included in with your convened materials were the summary evaluation report and the plan assessment, which provide detailed information about our plan with TCDRS. This slide provides a comparison of the plan demographics for the 2019 and 2020 plan years. A couple of things of interest. As more baby boomers are retiring and beginning to receive benefits, the average age and tenure for our active participants is declining. You may also notice that the plan funded ratio was at 93% at the end of 2019, and now it's slightly lower at 90%. This drop in the funded ratio occurred because the TCDRS Board of Directors reduced the investment return assumption from 8% down to 7.5%. They also decrease the inflation assumption. To help mitigate the impact of these changes, TCDRS used a portion of the system reserves and re-amortized liabilities. Uh, you may recall uh, that several years ago, the BRA Retirement Committee did a similar, um, but a little bit more aggressive adjustment to the assumptions for the BRA frozen plan. And that also decreased the reported funded ratio. As a result of the changes to the assumptions, the employer contribution rate will increase beginning in 2022. The 2021 rate is currently 7.57% and TCDRS has proposed an employer contribution rate of 9.32% for the 2022 plan year. We are not proposing any changes to the plan benefit provisions for 2022 and I'll answer any questions. Anyone has them? Any questions for Monica? All right. I see there's a resolution. Read the resolution. Be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority that the Texas County and District Retirement System plan provisions for Brazos River Authority non-retirees remain the same for the 2022 plan year. And be it further resolved that the TCDRS plan provisions for Brazos River Authority retirees remain the same for the 2022 plan year. And be it further resolved that the required TCDRS employer contribution rate will be 9.32% for the 2022 plan year. You've heard the reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Director Luton, so move. Director Henderson, second. You've heard a motion and a second. Please pull the board. Presiding Officer Flores? Yes. yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Fernandez? Yes. Director Henderson? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Crone? Yes. Director Lachance? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. <clears throat> Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Wilson? Yes. Item number four, discussion and possible action on peer plate wall assessment by Mike McClendon, Upper, Upper Basin, Basin Region, Region Manager. Manager. Good morning, uh, Presiding Officer Flores, uh, members of the board. Uh, this presentation of peer plate, Paul, peer plate wall assessment uh, is going to provide uh, information with regard to uh, some 
uh, construction activities that uh, has been going on uh, since uh, 2017. This is whenever we came to the board. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history, uh, walk you through uh, the process a little bit, uh, and then at the end, uh, seek an authorization from the board. Uh, this project falls uh, under the BRA strategic plan, uh, specifically section 2B1, uh, which states that the BRA is going to manage its water resources uh, and support long-term preventative maintenance of our dams and reservoir facilities. So some of the background information uh, I'll go over here briefly, and then, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll provide you some pictures that I think uh, maybe illustrate uh, what uh, the process and what I'm talking about a little bit better. Back in uh, the 1970s, we had a contractor. He performed some repairs to the spillway gates and to the pier plate walls. Uh, at that time, uh, the, the contractor applied uh, the metal pier plates uh, over the existing ones. Uh, so he welded uh, some additional welding uh, pier plates over the existing ones. Uh, back in 2017, we began to notice that the plates had begun to bow out, uh, resulting in really in some excessive leakage and damage to our gate seals. Uh, as you are aware, the uh, arson. Mike, you're muted, buddy. You're doing a great uh, job, but you're muted. Yeah. I mean, y'all got most of that, right? I think I just yeah. myself. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I had to move my camera. Um, so as you know, m most uh, in RSMU group back in the 90s is whenever the RSMU group began uh, performing the gate maintenance uh, at uh, Moore Shepherd Dam. Uh, and we, we knew the pier plate walls were going to have to be replaced. Uh, uh, but what we when we went in there and started to uh, make the repairs, we discovered it was going to be a more comprehensive uh, repair and require a structural engineer uh, to help perform the design. And so uh, we went and we re received authorization from the board to bring on Gannett Fleming uh, to uh, prepare the design. And I'll walk through that here in a little bit more uh, uh, in, in a few of my other slides that are coming up. Uh, we're using our RSMU staff because of the quality of work that they do, uh, what they can produce, uh, the skill level that they've obtained, and uh, we also know it's going to be done correctly. Uh, the staff up at uh, Possum Kingdom, the RSMU staff, uh, we, we know it's going to be done timely. Uh, it's going to be at a reduced cost, uh, and it's also going to alle alleviate some of the uh, construction contractor challenges that we've faced over the years. So it's a, a high-quality staff that uh, perf performs uh, very well. So I'll get into some of the slides here. Uh, so this th these photos kind of show you uh, work that our RSMU group does uh, at Moore Shepherd Dam. Uh, over here on the right, uh, you've got a photograph of the dam, gate two down uh, for maintenance. And so what occurs here is uh, I'm talking about the pier plate walls. So you've got the pier plate walls right here. If you can see that on the screen, uh, that's an area that we're working on specifically. And then also on the other side. And then here you can see the gate is in the down position. So right here, uh, we've got uh, one of our workers. Uh, this is back in 2017. We're removing the pier plates. Uh, and uh, this is kind of the process that uh, it's very intensive process to go through and remove this metal. And then on the back side, you'll see uh, some uh, concrete uh, that is, has to be removed ultimately. So right here, you can see uh, the pier plate has been removed. Uh, and then you've got the grout and then you've got some metal backer bar. And then right here is the gate that goes up and down. And so this slide I put in here, uh, this illustration is just to kind of give you a reference on how tight some of these tolerances are. And then over here on the right, uh, you're seeing the, the pier plate uh, that where the gate leaf uh, slides up and down against the side of this pier. And so what you're seeing here is the, the metal pier plate has been removed and uh, there's about four to five inches of grout that also has to be removed. And then this uh, metal backer bar uh, also has to be removed. So as I said earlier, 2017 uh, came to the board, uh, received authorization uh, for Gannett Fleming to perform the design uh, uh, to make the repairs. Gannett Fleming has done that, and uh, I'll show you some pictures. Uh, here's some of the design uh, that uh, Gannett, Fle Gannett, Gannett Fleming prepared for our SMU group, and then over here on the right, you'll see uh, where our folks uh, have fabricated uh, that design and then are mocking it up, uh, placing it uh, on the dam. Here's another photograph, uh, just to illustrate, uh, this is a real simple diagram, uh, but uh, uh, our folks fabricating uh, 
uh, the design. And then here over the right, you see a big uh, sheet of uh, large stainless steel uh, that's uh, being lowered uh, in place. And then th this next photo, I throw this in here because I'm really proud of the work. Uh, hopefully that comes through whenever I talk to y'all. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm proud of what these guys do up here. The, the fabrication process by our RSME group is it's outstanding. Uh, uh, we, we went out there. Uh, th these are some of the uh, templates that they built uh, to make sure that uh, the metal or the stainless steel doesn't uh, warp. It doesn't bend. Uh, and, and it's amazing to watch these guys in action. Uh, Gannett Fleming came out there. Uh, we consulted with some other fabricators. And uh, these guys, once they got it down, they really nailed it after that. And so our, our staff's ability to meet, you know, the required tolerances to make sure this slides up and down is, is just outstanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know we've gotten through COVID. So if any of you, uh, or uh, I say that, uh, we haven't gotten through COVID, but uh, some of the restrictions have been lifted. If there's an opportunity for y'all to come out to Possum Kingdom, I'd love to have y'all out there and uh, let y'all see some of the work that these guys are doing. Uh, this is gate uh, two, and uh, we should be completing gate two here shortly and uh, moving on to gate four, I believe. And so here's uh, kind of culminating uh, of what I was seeking the board's authorization today after kind of giving you that overview. Uh, as I said earlier, we had a contract with Gannett Fleming uh, to perform the engineering design. It was about $400,000. Uh, the earned contract value to date is about $355,000. And then if you'll look down here, RSMU labor uh, to perform that work on gate two is 158,000 roughly. The materials to uh, build or to repair uh, the stainless steel, the grout, the anchors, the welding supplies, about $133,000. What I'm coming to the board today is uh, moving forward. That was gate two. We've got eight more gates to uh, move forward with. And uh, so there's probably gonna be some more work where we're gonna need to consult with Gannett Fleming. Gannett Fleming's already given us the basic design that will be applied to all the gates. However, when you go to individual gates, sometimes there's some nuances that you may encounter. So we may have to call Gannett Fleming and consult with them. Uh, so there might be some uh, value uh, obtained with uh, continuing that partnership with them. One of the things that we will do most likely is the LIDAR scans that shows us where that rebar is and uh, so that'll be very helpful. Uh, another thing that uh, I know we'll definitely pursue with Gannett Fleming uh, if y'all approve this resolution is to uh, capture the as built. So that, that's very critical for future uh, uh, engineering firms and for our folks moving down the line. So what I'm looking at really is about twenty five to thirty thousand dollars possibly uh, with Gannett Fleming over the next uh, really it's, it's uh, takes about 18 months per gate to make the repairs. Uh, and so over the next about eight years, I think I've got one more slide. Uh, I do have a resolution. So uh, as I said earlier, it's about twenty-five to $30,000 <laughs> per gate that we anticipate. Uh, uh, it's going to be eight more gates over about 12 years uh, to make these repairs. And uh, that comes to a little less than about $300,000 in the resolution. Uh, because of the time frame associated with the repairs, I added a little bit more. So uh, I'm seeking the board's authorization to amend the contract with Gannett Fleming uh, to uh, to provide you know additional engineering and construction oversight services should they be necessary. Gannett Fleming's been really really good with us. If uh, if if no additional oversight is needed, you know we're not going to get charged, and uh, there won't be any. Uh, allocation against the contract associated with this. I, I tried to rush through that a little bit. I, I hope I didn't speak too fast, but uh, I can most definitely take any questions that y'all y'all have. So, uh, Mike, before you read your resolution, um, you have every right to be proud of your team. So uh, the pitchers tell all, and so you guys have done a, a great job. Um, when I was reviewing this agenda item, I initially thought, you know, what's twenty five or thirty five thousand dollars and you know what was David's cap on approval. But um, Mike is forward thinking and um, wanting the board to consider approval um, to get the job done to finish out the project. And so um, granted it's a eight year scope, but definitely in line with the mission of why we serve on this board to make sure that we're protecting our water supply and uh, keeping our dams in good shape is part of it. So um, I see somebody's <laughs> hand up. I don't know who that is. Did a board member have a question? Just a quick one. No, not long. The uh, uh, This particular contract is the, uh, what's the uh, date? What, 
how long does the contract go through currently? Yeah, no, it's it's open open. I mean, it's okay. Okay. once the work is complete is when it terminates. Got it. So there's no <laughs> modification. There. We're just looking there's at no the termination date. date. Correct. Gotcha. Yes. So we're just adding a few extra dollars for the as built, basically, and and any um things that come up along the along way. The way in particular. Yes, sir. That's correct. All right. Very good. That's all I have. Director Henderson, did you have a question? No, no, okay. I don't, but I appreciate all right. that. Director Lattimore, did you have a question? No, ma'am, I'm, I'm good. Thank you very okay. much. All right. Okay, seeing no other questions or comments, uh, <coughs> Mr. McClendon, will you read the resolution? Or your representative, actually, we have we have somebody reading all the resolutions. <laughs> yes, Steve, Steve Hamlin will be. Uh, thank you. Uh, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes and approves the general manager CEO to enter and execute a contract amendment with Gannett Fleming Incorporated to perform additional engineering and construction oversight services to meet operational and maintenance objectives at Moore Shepherd at AM in an amount not to exceed $325,000. You've heard the reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Director Huber Move approves. Was that Director Huber? Yes, ma'am. I'll second it. Say it more. And a second made by Director Lattimore. Please pull the board. Presiding Officer Flores. Yes. yes. Director Tallis. Yes. Director Taylor. Yes. Director Fernandez. Yes. Director Henderson. Yes. Director Huber. Yes. Director Crone. Yes. Director Lachance? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Franken? Yes. Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Wilson? Yes. Agenda item five, report and possible discussion on fiscal year 2021 second quarter budget report by David Thompson, Chief Financial Officer. Good morning. And what I have here is our standard second quarter report. There are three key elements of the financials that I'd like to report on. Revenues, which was $3.7 million over budget, and that's due to additional water sales that were not captured in our budget. Expenses is around about $4.7 million under budget, and uh, $2.7 of it the O&M expenses, and we just had lower spending on all the departments, as well as the operating projects was about $2.1 uh, million. And that is because those projects are multi-year projects and most of those variances were captured in our 22 budget. Last is our capital projects, which was $53 million in variance. Most of that is Allen's Creek. Here are the detailed financials that we just spoke about. And this is our how we spent through the second quarter our operating expenses. Are there any questions? I see a question from Director Henderson. That's right. I, how much of our expenses are due to COVID? Um, I realize that they're lower. So the savings we're seeing, is that anything to do with COVID? Uh, no, I will probably say some of the projects were impacted by it since that was in during that period. But uh, the expenses were probably more directed towards uh, uh, timing on hiring people. I know the Corps of Engineers was a big chunk of that, that they didn't spend money on the eight core lakes that we provided to them. And that's pretty much what I have on that. Except for maybe director's expenses, huh? There you go. <laughs> I, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, real quick, um, David, um, are there any um, COVID-related grant opportunities for um, to speak of 
to remediate or whatever to help us recoup any of those costs to the extent that it's even worth chasing it, right? Uh, you mean, were there e expenses that we incurred during that period? Are there any grant-related opportunities to recoup any expenses related to COVID? I, uh, I know we're pursuing some uh, right now with FEMA and okay. seeing where we're going with that. So you're absolutely right. And matter of fact, we just finished our SAMS registration and we will be filing with it on FEMA. So you're dead on, but we're going to pursue those expenses. We're also looking to see if TML, our insurance company, how much we can recover on that too. Gotcha. Very well. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, uh, David. If you'll move on to agenda item number six, report and possible discussion on fiscal year 2022 proposed annual operating plan. Okay, uh, talk a little bit about our budget process takes about eight months. We start back in December to build a bottoms up budget. Uh, we look at items that worked and things that didn't work. And then we also make sure that we've included anything new into the budget. Uh, why do we present the uh, proposed budget at this time? It's because it gives the board a chance to see what the numbers are coming up with for FY22. Also, an opportunity to ask questions about our budget. Uh, you want to keep it open in the fact that even after this board meeting, if you come up with questions, we'd be more than happy to answer those as well. I like using the rate making model here. I presented three years here because I want to remind the board between 20 and 21, we held the rates fixed because of COVID-19 and the struggling of our customers out there financially. Uh, I'd like to walk line by line through the, uh, the model itself. Later, I have slides to kind of back up some of these numbers. Uh, the first one is the, uh, the water supply operating expenses, and it went up about $3 million. And the majority of those, that $3 million is due to employee increases that we planned for 22. And also the Corps of Engineers had an increase in their, their budget for maintaining the eight core lakes that we have out there. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a slide later. Now then, the next line is called is the debt service that is subject to coverage. This is East Williamson County facility. Uh, and I, I'll talk a little bit more about the debt uh, subject coverage. That is a bond covenant and the calculation in that. Uh, the next is uh, debt without uh, coverage. And these are loans. <clears throat> the loans we have are, we have loans with the Corps of Engineers for the water storage for the eight core lakes we have out there. We also have a state participation loan uh, with Texas Water Development Board for Allen's Creek. We have a 30% portion that's ours it's about $4 million in debt. And then we've included the 70% or the Houston portion of 14 million, which is about $1.4 million in debt service. And we included this as in uh, adherence to the uh, house bill that was passed back in 20, uh, 2019. Next to the operating expenses, uh, operating projects expansion. These are projects that are studies, assessments that do not lead to building out of major infrastructures in our basin and they're included in our rates. That gives you a total expense of 59.7. Now let's look at the other revenues that we have out there. One is our non-system rate customers. These are our utility customers. It also has our two-tier customers in there too. And a reminder that two-tier means that the customer pays uh, one rate for the water used and one rate for the water not used. The other uh, water supply revenues we have is like East Williams County for the treated water that we sell. Uh, it also has sugar land in there, which is a waste treatment plant that we, we manage for it. And there's also like lake permits and grants and other things that are in that income there. That gives you a total of 18.5 million. Next is the debt coverage requirements. The board does require that we maintain a 1.3 ratio for the debt subject to coverage. It is also a bond covenant as well. 
So you simply you take the 30% uh, times the 2.5 million, and that gives you the 761,000. How this works is you take the 59.7 in expenses, you subtract out the revenue, you add back the 761, and that gives you what is required by our system rate holders of $42 million. You divide that by the system rate acre feet uh, contracts we have of 483,000, that gives you $87 an acre foot. One of the tools we have in our rate making uh, procedure is the fact that we can use uh, a thing called rate stabilization reserve to help smooth out these rates. The rate that we pro uh, have projected for the last two or three years has been $83 per acre foot for 22. So we're using a rate stabilization reserve of 1.9 million to bring the cost down to 40.1. Let's take a look at some of the, the numbers that we have out here. Uh, <clears throat> we have for sale 400, uh, 724,000 acre feet. Now we just talked about the 483,000 acre feet, which is about 67%. But the next two largest uh, customers we have are utilities and our two tier. Here's the revenues. Now it is spoke to you about the 40.1. That's what we're using for the $83 an uh, acre foot that we're using. And then you can see the seven that we talked about for the non-system rate customers. And then the 11.5 is made up of those revenues for it. Another revenue we have out there is the cost reimbursable revenue. And these are our customers that we manage facilities, but for every dollar of cost incurred, we bill that back to those customers. This is uh, customers like Temple Belton, uh, Dozier Farm, it's a Williams County Regional Raw Water Line. Later you'll see the expenses, the same expenses for 14.6 out there. Here, here are the proposed rates we have out there, and uh, you can see the $83. Another one is the agricultural, which is 70% of the three. And then you can see the average rates for the, the other items. Some of these rates really don't get set until we get the CPI index out in December. But we just give estimated rates on what we expect it to be in this budget. Now let's talk about expenses. Uh, we just talked earlier, we are using a 5% uh, increase for employees next year, and that's pretty much what we've been giving in the last few years. Uh, the Federal Reservoirs or the Corps of Engineers is, is set at 6.3 million and that's about $13 per acre foot of our $83. Here again is just a look at the uh, uh, what makes up our total expenses and you see the 14.6 for cost reimbursable matched to the revenue and this is the the balance is the 59.7 million that we showed earlier in the rate making model. Here's a list of the operating projects we're looking at for next year. Many of these are multi-year projects, uh, and again, I said, emphasize why we keep them in the rates is because they're, it does not build out any major infrastructure capital that we have in our base. Now let's talk a little bit about the capital improvement projects. You can see the biggest chunk is the new water, and I'll go ahead and go to the detail slides where you'll see that it, that's Allen's Creek. This chunk. I want to point out that there are two uh, uh, capital projects out there, the Williams County Regional Raw Water Line for phase three pumps and copper ion, copper ion generators. Both of those will be reimbursed by our customers. So we're not for that. This is really just to give you a, an idea of what makes up those numbers in, the, in our forecast. And you can see we have a large amount of spending being done to clean and improve our uh, infrastructure in our basin. And this just takes a look at the five-year financial forecast plan. You do see that in FY22, we're, uh, we're going to have a beginning, we're, we're going to propose to have a working capital of about 116 million, which is a very strong start. Uh, you can see that we're using the rate stabilization reserve uh, in 22 and then in 23 and then at that point I feel comfortable that our rates are on track to what we need for the major build out of infrastructure in the future years. This just takes a look at the rates that I've forecasted 
and they're pretty much in line with what we've enjoyed for the last two years. And uh, also, it's kind of a busy slide, but it also shows you the balancing act we do to on the debt service coverage we have to meet, as well as the board required reserves. Here's just the history, last 10 years history of our rates. And my goal is to try to keep it on an even keel going forward uh, to prevent any major spikes that we might have with the major infrastructure build out that we're planning on. I have a little more work to do. We still have our reimbursable customers to uh, meet with uh, through, uh, by June 20th. We also have a customer meeting coming up on uh, June 22nd. The goal is to have everything finalized and ready for the board to review in July. Any questions that you might have? I have a quick question, sure. um, David, on slide 14. <clears throat> so I know uh, because of COVID right there, because of COVID we did not increase rates and we kept them the same. What would have been the 2021 rate? Uh, it would have probably been $83, and th that's pretty much what the rate stabilization reserve was doing, was covering that. Okay. $1.9 million right there. All right. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Any, any other questions? Any other questions? So that right. $1.9 million Thank then was actually a COVID-related, I guess, cost in effect in terms of it. This revenues we would not have received because of actually we took and because of COVID. That is correct. All right. But we do use rate stabilization one more year, and then I believe we're back on track with our rates. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item number seven, report and report possible discussion on environmental on lab by <laughs> Tiffany Nelson, <laughs> environmental and compliance manager. Tiffany, thank you for waiting so patiently. Okay. No problem. Can everyone hear me and see the slides? Yes, thank you. Um, this is a follow on to my uh, agenda item from last board meeting. Um, and this is a project that has been uh, long on the books and often overcome by other projects. But this supports out of the BRA strategic plan um, part three, which is related to the protection of water resources and improvement of water quality where possible and uh, item 6D, which is ensure a safe working environment, promote safety conscious attitude in all employees, and facilitate implementation of proactive steps to reduce accidents and incidents. Um, as we discussed last time, we've been looking at uh, options to pursue a, a new environmental lab and the fact that ours was built over 20 years ago, um, our scope. It's not a true statement. Okay, it was designed about 20 years ago and uh, our scope has been uh, greatly expanded since then in the BRA and we have uh, now reached a maximum where we are essentially out of space. Um, the current status of the laboratory, we now have three independent re reviews that have cited deficiencies um, and no room for new equipment or to increase the number of existing analyses um, not enough room to comply with manufacturer's recommended space requirements for the equipment, uh, insufficient on-site storage space, we have no workshop space for the aquatic scientist, um, our environmental controls are somewhat inadequate, and, and we don't meet the industry standards for uh, safety. As you recall, we brought in in 2018 Gresham Smith to start looking at this problem pre-pandemic, and at the time, our current lab has 951 square feet and to bring us up to compliance with ADA standards, industry safety standards, and our manufacturer's equipment standards, uh, Gresham Smith estimated we would need approximately 5,700 square feet. Um, so pre-pandemic, they came in and looked at the entirety of the BRA, what we would need at central office going forward, and what uh, the environmental services group would need. At the time, they identified that a central office would have a net need of 2,400 or 24,000 square feet to house 
up to 126 employees anticipated over the next 10 to 15 years. However, they did conclude that even at that time, with their recommendations for reconfiguring of central office and moving environmental services and the office of safety and security out of central office, we would still max the capacity of central office out in 15 years. So that was one of their largest recommendations was to uh, build an offsite uh, in, called environmental operations facility that would house uh, all of environmental services. Uh, the office of safety and security would include um, our business continuity hardware and would also include the electrical operations department and then uh, structured modifications to central office to more efficiently use the space. And that would give us at least 15 more years of use at a central office. Now, of course, that was all pre-pandemic when everyone had a hard office space and worked full time in the office. We went back post-pandemic based on the success of our uh, remote working and evaluated five additional scenarios. Um, the first three were reduced footprints for an off-site environmental operations facility. Um, scenario one, removed the safety and security team. Scenario two, removed also the space for the electrical and skated team from the shop building. And then scenario three, they did a full reduction to just environmental services of the entire proposed site. Um, the last two scenarios, which y'all authorized us to look at at the last board meeting, involved opportunities on central office property. Um, scenario four, we looked at building a lab and storage workshop space adjacent to central office on central office property. Um, the electrical operations team will remain in their lease location off-site. Um, environmental services staff and OSS staff offices will remain in central office. Um, and this will require eventual structure modifications to central office to house growth, but it won't require immediate uh, remodeling. Scenario five is to expand the laboratory to the needed footprint within central office. Um, that will require um, pretty immediate and some significant modification to central office. Uh, this is just a summary of the, the proposed space scenarios. As you see, um, with scenario five, we only get to that recommended 5,700 square feet that Gresham Smith assessed was needed to meet uh, safety um, ADA requirements and equipment uh, requirement. So that solution still provides no room for expansion of analyses. Um, we still fight the uh, productivity issues with having 90% um, of our field equipment stored off-site um, in a, a boat storage facility on the other side of Lake Waco. And so that one is really not a very strongly favored right now. Um, we did have Gresham Smith do class four OPCC cost estimates for each scenario. Um, in light of current uh, supply chain issues leading to higher building costs, they have recommended that for budgetary purposes, we work with the high end estimates. However, they fully anticipate or their costing group has that by the time we've completed design in an additional year, year and a half, those will have normalized and we could go back to um, budgeting closer to their actual OPCC number. Our recommendation, uh, we think scenario four works the best. It's the most cost effective. It meets the needs for growth and consolidation of all of the environmental services equipment on one site. It uh, provides space for future increases in the number of types of analyses and provides for the maximum potential office space to incorporate growth over the next 15 years. Um, the benefits of that is the modification at CO can be performed on a phased as needed basis, which uh, mainly is converting to a more open concept work plan. And those modifications would be non-structural with a uh, Scenario five, there would be some significant structural modifications that would have to be made to fit the lab within central office. Um, 
One of the other big benefits of recommendation four is, you know, after modification of workspaces in central office, central office will be able to house 107 positions at one time with 19 positions working remotely. If we went with scenario five, um, after we modified central office, it would be able to hold 76 positions at one time with 50 positions working remotely. So the displacement is much greater trying to put expand the lab within the cent current central office's footprint. Um, this is just Gresham Smith's proposed scenario plan for site four. We would have a laboratory building here. Um, this would be masonry, look similar to central office. And then right here, we would have a engineered metal building for a boat storage and a workshop space for the aquatic scientist. Um, this is just a more detailed uh, view of it. And you can see for those who've worked, walked around central office, basically all the interior office spaces, hard offices would be reduced to um, open space work areas that would give remote workers opportunities to have a space when they come to central office to plug into a docking station um, would allow those staff that need to be in the office permanently to look at it. Um, and then of course for departments that are uh, handle sensitive material, HR, the legal department, they still have their hard office spaces. Um, next steps eventually will be to complete and advertise an RFP for design for the selected scenario, um, execute the design contract and begin design. But before we get to that point and ask permission to take those next steps, we would like to uh, hear any comments, concerns, questions you would like us to answer before we bring a proposal back at the next board meeting to ask for permission to go to that. Next Thank you, Tiffany, great presentation. The, the other thing that is key here is our executive management team getting our hands around what normal looks like uh, again we're we're consistent with a lot of the corporate world and we're opening back up and things in june will look a whole lot different than they have the last few months uh, but there are you've heard me talk about this a little bit there's a tremendous need for growth uh, for all of the the projects that we have coming and all of the things that we're doing and, and we bragged so many years about being one deep and, and you can't be successful if you're going to run as hard as we are being one deep uh, and then also there are some uh, significant advantages for allowing the workforce uh, to not have to report to waco uh, we have made some strategic hires for folks that i'm not sure that that would have signed on with BRA, but for us forcing them to come to Waco. Uh, so what we're trying to do between now and the time that we bring this to the board for consideration is understand how this plays into that entire bigger picture uh, and the advantages and pros and cons of, of what that looks like. We're, we're convinced as a staff, I'm convinced as a CEO that, that we need the lab space. Uh, uh, our lab is doing great things as we talked about during the PK presentation, we're going to continue to expand to protect the resource that we have and the, the water supply of the great state of Texas. Uh, so we just still, like Tiffany said, we want we wanted you all to, to look at this. If you don't want to give us input today, look at it, provide me some feedback in the in the weeks to come. And, and uh, we're, cons we're we're wanting to know what you think about these these additions. Director Savage had a question. Uh, Yes, I was just wondering, you know, so we've got two pretty big projects that are uh, acquisition, you know, so if Allen Creek were to move forward and then I, I can't remember the name of the other one that's up there uh, where we're reviewing the uh, the waste of a, of a mining operation tailings, uh, but is it in Grimes County? But if those two were to come in, what impact would that have on your lab load, Tiffany? Uh, I mean, that's where we're getting this 15%. I mean, would it be more than that? Or are we making sure we're kind of planning adequately for the future? Uh, we're right now, honestly, we can't handle the increased workload of just the additional reservoir monitoring. We will have to be using a contract lab for that because we can't with the equipment we have and the staff we have and the space we have, we can't take on more. So any additional projects, Allen's Creek, yes, will require more water quality monitoring. The other 
uh, project will certainly require a new asset that we need to perform water quality monitoring on. So the ability to take on and run more samples and expand, we are right now very restricted. We we can't. We have maxed out what we can do in the space we have. So anything additional is going to require contract labs until such time as we can remedy our space issues. And I'll be honest, in the world of surface water and what you have to do to meet TCQ quality control standards for participation in the Clean Rivers program, we have not been abundantly successful in finding contract labs that can meet the quality control requirements those samples have. We have some, we're doing the best we can, but honestly, we can usually only accept about half the data because it's not the way most commercial labs are set up to run. Well, and I know from my own uh, extensive lab experience, you know, with Malco that that's that's quite costly to do the offsite stuff. And mm -hmm. I think we can just expect more and more environmental needs to grow. So I think that uh, this scenario four is great. It's also, you know, it, it's being nimble because, you know, we're taking into account what we learned from COVID and having the offsite work folks. So I, I think it's a it's a great recommendation. Thank you. So, Tiffany, I have a question, um, kind of a follow-up, I think, to um, what Director Savage was talking about. So, number four, will you put that slide up? Um, that is the one that you're you're proposing. <clears throat> yes. So, you said over the next 15 years. So, we know that it takes a while to build to to get our reservoir Allen's Creek and everything mm -hmm. up and running. So you're you're saying that that proposed number four will get us for about 15 years and at which point we have Allen's Creek that we've doubled our organization in size basically as far as the requirements of what we're doing. So is that realistic? Is that just a band-aid? Um, no, th this proposed uh, scenario four includes significant room for expansion. So this gets us the 5,700 we need to function right now, plus roughly an additional, I'm trying to do the math in my head and I'm not that good at it, 3,300 square feet or so for expansion, for taking on new analyses. We know there are some things um at work at the state and federal levels that will probably necessitate change in some of the analyses we run now and require some new much larger equipment than what we have so we have tried to incorporate everything we can think of coming forward at us for as far as increased work um, changes in analytical methods that we see coming down the road um, from the state and federal government so we do have expansion room in here this is not a band-aid for the lab okay are there any other questions from the board looks like director henderson has a question oh jen henderson did you have a question i do have one question really quick for you tiffany um mm -hmm. it looks like we're going to look at one large lab for the whole basin um have you thought about maybe doing two smaller labs, one in in the northern part, one in the southern part? Would that even help you? Um, I'm just kind of thinking outside the box to see if there's something. We have to to uh, submit data to Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. We have to go through the NELAP accreditation process, which is National Laboratory Environmental Laboratory accreditation process. Their standards make having satellite labs very difficult. We have pursued that before because, um, to be honest, bacteria has a very short holding time for us and it's difficult to get from the far reaches. And uh, we did try to propose establishing a lab at PK at one time and it was uh, rebuffed pretty strongly because we wouldn't have we, the oversight. We would basically have to duplicate all the quality control staff, all the lab staff. I think it would end up in a larger operation than what we need. Great, I'm glad you explored that, thank you. Any other questions? Director Savage, did you still have a question? No, let me get my hand down. Okay. 
Any other board members? Just a quick comment, this board Taylor. Uh, I think the repurposing of the of the existing offices into cubicle type work setting makes all the sense in the world. You're not building new infrastructure outside. Uh, this just seems like the the, the log, most logical way to go. And uh, but I think your numbers are very reasonable. They, they're, they sound high, but there is, from my experience, there's probably no higher cost per square foot than building lab space. If I you're, you're correct with uh, Gresham Smith, they said lab space is roughly not quite $700 per square foot, whereas building office space from the ground up is running at $300 to $450 a square foot. So lab space, because of the environmental controls it requires to have, is very expensive. And, and, I, and from a communication standpoint, I understand technology and all. I still think it's better to have all of it in one central location. Uh, been spread apart uh, to a different site. I like this plan. I think y'all have done a really good job of thinking this thing out. Thank you. That's all. Thanks, Cynthia. My hand now. Thank you. Seeing no other questions. Tiffany, thank you for the presentation. All right. Thank you. All right. Moving on to agenda item eight, report and possible discussion on integrated water resource plan by John King, special projects and strategic initiatives manager. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Today I'll be introducing you to the project called the integrated water resource plan. We won't be requesting any action today that will come in a subsequent board meeting, but more just to familiarize you with the concept as we move forward. It specifically supports the BRA's mission as described in sections 1E3 and 4A2 of the strategic plan. And in this graphic, what we see is an illustration of what the projected growth numbers are for the basin over the next 50 years. Um, we know that significant growth is coming. We're seeing it every day in our community. Along with that, our internal analysis and requests from customers all indicate that additional water supplies will be needed to support this growth. The integrated water resource plan process will develop a robust guide for us to stabilize the future of our water supply portfolio across the basin. Just as a frame of reference to kind of get the idea of the concept, the IWRP at the highest level will answer two questions for us. Number one is what else do we need to do beyond the base, the regional water planning process to meet our water needs. What other strategies? What are the resources do we need to look at? And number two is what's next. So after we currently have our current projects completed, then what do we need to do next to meet our future needs? And that's important to understand is once we know what we need to do, implementing it in the correct sequence, uh, there, there's great value in that as well. So to Digging a little bit deeper into what the process is and, and some of the benefits. If we think back to the first slide, the size of the Brazos River Basin itself represents a, a challenge in managing the resources throughout. We have issues that are considered basin wide, and then we have others that are more regional, local in, in the, their scenario. So the benefits of undertaking this new type of planning are it prepares a guide for the development of integrated, reliable, resilient, and sustainable water supply resources. The IWRP will incorporate advanced planning, modeling, and decision-making techniques to build a plan that addresses a wide field of potential future demand and operational scenarios. Through the process, it will apply risk and uncertainty considerations in the evaluation. In addition, there will be uh, internal and external stakeholder involvement through a very transparent and proactive process. When we get to the end, we'll have a repeatable framework to evaluate projects and then also a process to prioritize them to make sure we're implementing them correctly. The outputs of this plan can also be used in future regional water planning efforts. And at the top of the slide, I just have some of the, the key steps through the process and when we come back to you for uh, approval, we'll have more detail on those, but wanted to kind of give you that. So when we think about what's currently be, being done in planning efforts and what this is proposing, it's important to understand how it's different. Current efforts provide an important foundation 
for our water resource planning. But this type of planning takes it a step further. Again, it evaluates water supplies, demands, and water management strategies in a manner that considers risk and provides a, a framework to evaluate the correct priority to implement the projects. The evaluation process will include multiple scenarios of future water demand. It'll be based on variability and key drivers, things like population and industrial growth, effectiveness of conservation manners, climate and economic factors. The IWRP will integrate individual and local projects with regional projects to form a comprehensive basin-wide plan for the BRA. Ultimately, it will result in an adaptive roadmap for future water supply development that includes specific trigger points for recommended action if and when changes occur in the future. When we come back in the next board meeting, what we're going to propose is to implement it in a multiple phase project. Phase one will focus on the Little River watershed. We're going to take that as what we'll call our pilot for the basin wide plan. It'll help us refine our process and uh, get better at what we're doing as we go through it. The other part of taking on the Little River watershed focus is it will support near term decisions that need to be made for planning additional water supplies in that area. At the end of phase one, we'll have a complete adaptive IWRP for the Little River watershed, but it'll have all the elements and then it'll be incorporated into the basin wide plan once we complete that in subsequent phases. We're currently in scope and fee negotiations. Uh, we're seeing a timeline of approximately 18 months to complete phase one and our initial fee estimate comes in around 1.4 million. So again, we're not requesting any action today. It was just more to get the information to you and see what types of questions you may have on it or any other thoughts as we move through the scope and fee negotiation. Any questions? Hey, John, this is uh, Director Savage. I, I just had a, you know, you're uh, having public hearings right now on the, the five year state water plan. Does that move much or uh, have you, I'm sure you guys are paying attention to that. Uh, can you give us a little bit of an update on on BRA's input into the state water plan? I would have to get that information for you, David. I'm personally not involved in that and in, okay. in what I'm doing, but there we do have input into that process. Um, the regional G process and region H as well. I know we have representatives who regularly attend those meetings. But this this doesn't replace those efforts by any means. It takes some of the information from there and then other considerations and forms a different framework for us to evaluate our future plan. I think having that flexibility is extremely important. And I think as the state population changes and the water resources needs become more glaring that you know we're going to have to adapt to the comprehensive plan of the state as well. So I just want to make sure that we're or communicating, you know, with that larger plan as well. Director Savage, we we have voting members on on both. Well, we have voting members on all up and down the basin for the different regions, and and we're very proactive, uh, very active in in the state water planning process. The difference between this and that, the analogy that I would give you is is that the st state water planning effort. Let's let's just say it's on a thirty thousand foot view. Right. And this is on a 500 foot view, and this is ultimately working through solution sets with our customers so we can understand not only how they're going to use and conserve the water, but how it fits into their CIP and, and future expenditures. OK, thanks for that clarification. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Sean, for the information. Moving on to agenda number nine, report and possible discussion on legislative updates by Matt Phillips, Legislative and Governmental Affairs Manager. How is the Capitol, Matt? Crickets. Well, I'm trying to bring up my slides. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Actually, probably hear it in the background. Um, he cut his hair. <laughs> did, I did that too. It, it got so bad, it started falling out, so. I just had to go ahead and go with it. Um, I'm not sure why this is viewing so small. There we go. Can y'all see all that? Yeah, we're good, Matt. 
Okay, good. So, uh, and let me turn this down. This is the house in the background, actually. So, um, it's actually rare to get to do this presentation during this time because normally we don't have a meeting until uh, July, and then the one before that's in April. And a lot happens between April and June uh, at the Capitol during session. So, this is actually kind of a good time to to get to see you all. Uh, there's one week left, so they finish up uh, next Monday. And as you would imagine, the next few days, because Wednesday is the last day that either body uh, can pass bills, uh, the next few days are going to be long. Uh, they'll go all the way till midnight or past uh, every single day. Uh, both bodies probably will. At least that's what we expect now because of some infighting they may. <laughs> A couple of them may adjourn here or there uh, for time periods, maybe shorter than that, uh, just to show the other side. In fact, they kind of had that happen this weekend where – Instead of staying through the weekend, the House adjourned uh, last Thursday all the way until Sunday uh, because they didn't believe the Senate was moving enough of their bills. Um, so that's that's kind of where we are in the process. Everybody's tired of each other um, and the bodies are kind of fighting back and forth. But that said, uh, things are moving and things are getting done. And, and I'm, as I've usually done through this session, I'll kind of start with some of the broader topics and kind of narrow my way down to the stuff that really affects us or the stuff that we're watching more closely. So I've talked a lot about these four major issues. Uh, the legislature was kind of slammed uh, this session already because you already had the budget and COVID and redistricting. And then we, when we had the winter storm, you added to that making reforms to the electric grid, which is huge. Um, I do think they're gonna get progress on at least three of those. Uh, the budget is in conference and I'm told that there is a, a deal uh, to, to adopt a budget that everybody has agreed to. Um, so that's obviously the only thing constitutionally that they really have to do every session is to pass a budget. And so I think they are gonna get there. I think what helped with that was the fact that the, the, the revenue estimate ended up looking more rosy than folks thought it would have uh, post COVID or, or because of COVID. So I think, you know, that ended up helping them be able to uh, to negotiate a budget. Uh, speaking of COVID, I think this is something that we expected to come out of this session. And I'm not sure what these things will look like once they hit the governor's desk because they involve the governor's executive power um, to issue disaster declarations uh, and, and law suspensions and things like that. But uh, the two measures I list here, SJR 45, House Bill 3, both have in them the ability for or both have in them limits on the governor's ability uh, to issue certain length uh, disaster dec declarations. And they also uh, limit the ability of local governments to adopt ordinances during disasters that are different from what the state issues. So they kind of attack both levels and they now will require more legislative involvement in things like disaster declarations, pandemics, and, and, and things of that nature. So it'll be interesting to see the governor's response to that once they get to his desk, because, you know, I, I don't know that he's going to veto them, but I'm, I'm sure they'll be given some thought. You know, you're basically being asked to sign something that limits your own power. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what those end up looking like. Um, on electricity, and this is one again that kind of came out of the, the winter storm and kind of hit the legislature unaware as they were already starting on these other things, but there are gonna be some reforms passed. Uh, probably the one that's the most key to us is SB3. Um, it actually includes a lot of the reforms that are in House Bill 11, 12, 13, 14. <laughs> Those include things like supply chain mapping, weatherization, uh, reforms to ERCOT and the ERCOT board and what they have to look like. But Senate Bill 3 specifically has a section related to providing uh, uh, plans for backup generation for water and uh, for water treatment facilities or water related facilities, which obviously affects us. Uh, you know, we had the situation uh, with our East Williamson County plant, and that is one that we are already working on uh, to make sure that we have adequate backup generation in the future. We will wait to see what Senate Bill 3 ends up looking like so that we don't start something and then have to redo it or change it. But basically, we'll have to have a plan on file with TCEQ that clearly lays out how we're going to continue operation of that facility, at least in some way, during uh, an extended power outage. Uh, the one thing I will say is the bill does provide some exceptions for other types of facilities, those being raw water facilities, many of which we also operate. 
um, that, that does not require you to provide backup generation to facilities that would otherwise not be in operation or would be subject to interruption uh, by contract. And we have some of those facilities. It obviously doesn't make sense to operate something that really doesn't need to be running during that type of disaster. So, or, or to have backup generation for something that won't be running during a disaster. So the, that language is in there and we, we, were, we were part of crafting that and we're glad that it's been included. Um, redistricting, this is absolutely no surprise. They'll have a special session likely in the fall. Uh, they don't have the census data. And so the, the thought is they'll be called back at some point, maybe in September or October uh, to work on that, that really fun subject that they get to do every 10 years. So, and, and it was always expected they wouldn't finish that during the regular session. Any questions on any of those? No questions, Matt. All right, I'll move to the next one. So other issues, you know, these are other broader issues, but ones that the legislature is spending time on. Uh, rural broadband, that was a focus of the legislature, particularly given COVID and folks having to work from home and do school from home and those kind of things. They did pass House Bill 5. Uh, it creates a broadband development office. It creates a program uh, to promote uh, broadband in rural areas and then also an account that will at some point come with funding once there's a plan to distribute that funding in order to get broadband out to the rural areas of our state. Public funds for lobbying. This is one that has come up the last few sessions. I do think there's agreement on a bill, although it has not made its way completely through the process, but that is Senate Bill 10. Um, as Senate Bill 10 initially passed the Senate, it would not have applied to us. It applied strictly to municipalities and counties. Um, as Senate Bill 10 looks now, and as it is on the House calendar for tomorrow, it does apply to us. It applies to all types of districts, river authorities, you know, MUD, SUDs, all, all the different entities. Um, we will not in any way be prohibited um, from hiring uh, folks that, that do lobby work for us. However, uh, when the board does approve those contracts, they will have to be done in a separate standalone vote from the budget. Um, and then we will have to post the information related to those contracts on our website. Nothing, nothing of which is problematic for us because those have always been public records and, and we have we have no issues with that at all. So going forward, should Senate Bill 10 pass in its current form, that's how we will have to deal with with lobby contracts. Um, eminent domain, obviously an issue that that also comes up relatively every session. There were a number of different reforms passed, none of which in our opinion, significantly hinder our ability to when we have to exercise our power of a minute domain. That's obviously not something we ever really want to do and, and not something and something we rarely ever do. Um, but there are a number of, you know, kind of minor reforms uh, uh, passed related to that. Probably the biggest one for us, because at times we will acquire property that we might have to hold on to for a while, given how long it takes to implement projects, but is the right to repurchase. There were some changes made. Uh, basically limiting how long you could hold on to property before you had to offer it for repurchase. However, it does exempt projects that are in the state water plan. Um, so there's an exemption for our type of project in that. So that was that was helpful. There's also going to be some significant changes made to the landowner bill of rights, just some additional information. And that's something that we have to post on our website. So whatever those end up looking like, we will end up putting that uh, out with with all of the stuff we generally put out. I see there's a hand up I'm trying to find who it is. That's Director Luton. Yeah, yeah Director. Matt, yes, Matt. Will the funding for the broadband program come from the COVID relief funds? It, it could, but but it also could just come from state appropriations. So it could come from either source. Thank you. And 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 I will say that's also going to depend on what it looks like in the budget. And and I can look at that, but I can't speak to exactly what it looks like in the conference report because I haven't seen it. And then public meetings, particularly virtual ones like we're doing right now, um, it's odd. At the beginning of session, I think everyone thought they would make virtual more widespread, that it would become more of a thing. Um, you know, I think that's something I talked about in previous updates. But surprisingly, they're going to end up doing very little on that. I think the idea of going back to normal uh, and doing in-person meetings has become more the norm. And I think the thought is that if we ever have another situation like COVID, um, that the governor can obviously make you know, certain suspensions of, of rules and laws to allow us to do virtual if we have to, but that there wasn't any need to make widespread changes in law to make virtual more the norm. And I think that was the fear that some of the members had is that virtual would become the norm as opposed to the exception. And so I think that's why you're not going to see a lot of changes to to 
the open meetings law that allow more virtual meetings. Any questions on those? So Matt, that that was the governor's um, thing. So mm -hmm. back to the the HB three and the limited governmental power, mm -hmm. government governor powers, et cetera. Will that fall under that if there's changes to that bill? It, it could, it could. And specifically what would fall under it is the length of time for which it can be in existence. So the governor could initially do it, but for how long and how long he can extend those, that would then be subject to some sort of legislative review. So the legislature would have more say in how long those were extended. So yes, it would. Okay. Uh, dialing down into water issues, quiet water session. It just was. And, and I think that was expected. Um, we talked about this uh, in the last update, produced water or water that comes from the oil and gas process. Uh, Senate Bill 601 creates a produced water consortium that's going to look at, and that's going to include industry as well as CQ, the Water Development Board, looking at ways to make that more of a potential supply. <laughs> Um, so I think that's something that we might end up participating in as a as a water supplier if it if it becomes an issue in our basin. Um, groundwater, there always seems to be reforms to groundwater every single session. There is one kind of you know broader groundwater bill that Senate Bill 152 that makes some tweaks to district rulemaking and also makes some increases permit notice that districts have to do. One version of Senate Bill 152 also includes. A, a version of what's called loser pays. Right now, only groundwater districts can recover attorney's fees in a lawsuit. And uh, the change in law that 152 made as it passed the Senate allows those who are suing a district to obtain attorney's fees if they were to prevail. That's a very controversial topic with districts. It was stripped out in the House. Uh, when that bill goes to conference, I imagine that'll be the biggest issue that gets discussed, and I can't really say how it's going to turn out. Um, TCQ dam inventory, we saw this coming as well with some of the, the failed dams uh, in, in some areas of Texas. So TCQ is going to create a public inventory of River Authority managed dams. So ours will be in there. Um, in addition to just the basic information about the dams, we'll have to provide maintenance plans or, or at least what we plan to do to maintain those those structures. And that's something that we have no problem providing. There is obviously language in there accepting any sort of security related information so the, the we won't have to provide anything that that creates any sort of security risk it'll just be basic information on our dams and and how we maintain them and how we plan to maintain them in the future which is always a story that we like to tell and then the texas water trust uh, the the parks and wildlife department is going to be given a little bit more uh, leeway to try to encourage dedication of water rights to the Texas Water Trust. Obviously, we have a donation to the Texas Water Trust as part of our system operations permit. I think the goal here is to try to encourage more donations to the trust because I think since it's been put in place, there's only been three, and I think it's been in place since Senate Bill 1 back in 1997. So I think that's the goal of that, is to encourage more water right donations for environmental flows. Any questions on those? And then last but not least, uh, the BRA Sunset Bill. Uh, so it has the basic across the board or ATB language that Sunset puts in all statutes for all of the entities it reviews. Um, it passed out of the House in April and then passed out of the Senate last Friday, and it is waiting to be sent to the governor for signature. So it was reported and rolled today. And so there's a couple little I dots and T crosses that have to happen, which are administrative processes. But after that, it'll be sent to the governor where we fully expect it will be signed. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions on anything I covered or anything else that I didn't cover. I see a hand up. Yeah, real, real quick question coming back to the last page or the most or rather the previous page. I apologize mm -hmm. with respect to the TCEQ dam inventory. I'm guessing that um, I'm hoping anyway, we made a fairly significant investment in asset management programs and the related software. I would think that that was something that we're going to leverage to towards uh, that particularly particular, I guess, uh, reporting requirement. Yes, absolutely. It, it, will, uh, it will it will inform that for us for sure. And will that be? Do you think sufficient as currently envisioned? Yes, you know, probably what we will have will be more than sufficient based on the information they're they're required to maintain. And I guess that would be in addition to the benefits that we gain on capital planning and all the other good things. Correct. Very good. 
Very well, thank you, sir. Hey, Matt, uh, I had a question. I, I saw an interesting article in Odessa. You know, they've come up with a new small scale produced water uh, desalination plant. You know, is that, did you hear any more or anything about that? Uh, not about that specific plant, but I know that it's something that that is being explored, and and it's one of the reasons that that Senator Perry, who's the chair of the Water and Rural Affairs Committee, is so interested in Senate Bill 601. Is his bill, and he's from that the Panhandle area, and his kind of his logic is we've got so much of this this water that comes out of this process. Surely there's a way to make it into a usable uh, a product, um, and and it could could create a water source that that you know could be potentially pretty large so yeah i think i think it's 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 individual instances like that trying to find a way okay can we broaden that can we can we expand that and and make it make it bigger um and so i and i and our take on that is to the extent that it can be done in a way that's safe we want to make sure that it that it's not done in a way that if if particularly if injected back into the stream would in any way harm the the quality of, of our water or the water that we need to make available, we're interested in any new supply source. We're, we're, we're not going to ignore any. So it's one of those things that we'd be happy to participate in and be very interested in as it moves forward. Yeah, I saw they were planning to actually use it for irrigation and, and grow some crops and then make sure there weren't any heavy metal concentrations or anything else. But it, it looked it looked pretty interesting and that would be pretty big for us in that upper end of the basin, I would think. Yeah, and I think I think on a on a much larger scale, the idea would maybe be if you could, you know, produce enough of it and then use the river as a natural channel to move it to places where you want to move it to. And that, I mean, that's that's obviously a big, big type of project, but you've got to make sure that if you're going to do that, that it is treated to, to such a level that it's not going to cause any degradation of water quality, which would be our biggest concern. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for me? All right, well, uh, like I said, seven more days and then uh, everybody will be happy again, I hope. Thank you all. Oh, well, we got some dead air. You want to talk about election reform? <laughs> <laughs> Is it going to happen? I'd rather not. <laughs> okay. Why would we? Okay. Now we're not muted. Yeah. It muted itself. I'm not sure what happened there. Now, can I do 10? All right. Mike McClendon, you're on again. Agenda okay. item item 10, discussion and possible action on the Castle Project Phase 3. We're putting uh, you to work today, Mike. Yes, ma'am. I'm enjoying it. Uh, thank you all. This is my last presentation for today. Uh, uh, the Castle Project also uh, falls under our strategic plan, uh, the same as the Pier Plate Wall, uh, specifically Section uh, 2B1. Uh, again, that says that the BRA is going to manage its water resources. Uh, support long-term preventative maintenance of our dams and our reservoir facilities. So uh, to give you a little bit of background, uh, we initially briefed this project in October 2018. That was phase one. There's four phases associated with this project. Uh, phase two we presented to the board in uh, January 2020. I'm going to provide an overview of the project uh, and then Mr. Stuart Vakti uh, with Gannett Fleming is going to provide a detailed review of phase two and then uh, moving forward with the plan phase three. Stuart presented with me last time in person uh, in January, and I thought that was a good way to uh, provide some information to the board. Uh, and you hear it from, uh, I guess, the horse's mouth, if you will. Uh, sorry, Stuart. But uh, so uh, uh, you get that information directly from uh, one of our consultants. Uh, the, the the concrete and service life uh, e extension project it, it's a comp it's a comprehensive evaluation of our uh, concrete and the structural components of the dam of Moore Shepherd Dam, and it's going to culminate into a, a risk based assessment in which those areas that uh, show greater risk are then going to be prior prioritized uh, for subsequent repair. And I will tell you this is a little bit long presentation. Uh, because I've got uh, Stuart going through some of the details, uh, so I wanted to say that up front. Um, construction, Moore Shepherd Dam occurred uh, 1938, was completed in 1941. 
uh, the goal of this project is to extend the service life uh, by evaluating the condition of the existing structure uh, and then develop the next steps to maximize the useful life of the facility. Uh, when we designed uh, the scope of services, uh, uh, the intent was to follow a phased approach. Uh, and we structured it in that manner uh, because we believe it provides several benefits to uh, the Brazos River Authority uh, and also uh, to the engineer. Uh, number one, it allows us to be methodical uh, and efficient as uh, we work through uh, the project because of the project scale and some of the uncertainty uh, that uh, would be encountered. Uh, number two, uh, uh, it's structured in that manner because it provides uh, uh, reduced scope changes and it also allows for credible scope development uh, as you progress to the next phase. And I've got kind of an example of that here in a slide shortly. But lastly, and probably one of the more important reasons why we uh, developed this phased approach is I believe it's more transparent. Uh, it allows us to walk you through the project, uh, provide updates like we're doing here, uh, and uh, opportunity to ask questions, and then the opportunity for us to uh, tell you where uh, we anticipate the next steps as we move forward. So I said there were four phases associated with the project. Uh, so this slide kind of illustrates that. Uh, phase one really consisted of the development uh, of the investigation and testing program. There was a lot of document review. Uh, there was some uh, simplified structural evaluation and stuff going on. Phase two, we entered into the uh, investigation and testing mode. Uh, and then uh, as we move forward, transition to phase three, it's going to consist of the analysis of the testing from phase two and, and then perform some additional, uh, I guess, targeted testing. And, uh, you know, I mentioned it. Uh, the opportunity for uh, changing your scope a little bit. One of the things that we did do, uh, as you can see here, I don't know if it, if you notice it, but um, this phase right here, which was originally scheduled for phase four, some of those tasks are going to be incorporated into, into phase two. And uh, Stuart will go through in a little bit more detail uh, and, and provide that. Uh, this is my last slide, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Stuart. Uh, as I said earlier, our goal is to uh, guide the decision-making process to achieve a longer service life of Moore Shepherd Dam. Uh, we anticipate phase three to take approximately 12 months to accomplish. Uh, the four tasks that are associated with phase th uh, three are listed here. So targeted destructive testing, uh, failure mode progression analysis, destructive investigation, repair support, and then some long-term structural concrete testing and repair program. So I'll turn it over to Stuart. He'll give you, uh, like I said, some detail into what transpired during phase two and uh, where we move into phase three. And I'll move the slides forward uh, for Stuart as, as we move along. And so right, I'll thank you. turn it over to Stuart right now. Yeah, thank you, Mike. You can, you can hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Thank you, Board President Flores, Mr. Collinsworth, and the board for having me today. Like uh, Mike said, I got a fair amount of content to go over, so I'll try and go through it quickly uh, and uh, provide a little context background. We'll just do a little recap of uh, the previous phases before we hit. Uh, we walk through phase three, so uh, that context is there about what's really driving phase three. So, you know, like Mike said, this. Uh, this is a multi-phase program and one of the early things that we did is we looked at the structure and uh, we want to evaluate the high risk components on this so we know where to focus our efforts uh, here and the slabs and the corbels were identified as the features that were the highest risk and most concerning uh, for for this evaluation so that's so that's really what this effort is and the, and the FN chart was what we call that on the upper right hand corner of that slide uh, shows individual features and failure modes through the risk analysis and the goal is to get anything out of the red really drive it down into the yellow or the green so into the lower risk uh, component so that really helps us focus our effort let's see next slide so the phase two investigation uh, what this shows here is it uh, it was focused on four bays there's 40 bays across the entire dam plus the earth embankment section but we focused on four bays to try and evaluate in detail, all 40 bays would have been a, an extremely expensive, costly, and lengthy program to do. So we we distinctively and intentionally picked four bays to do a, uh, a detailed evaluation of, bays 1, 9, 23, and 31. So part of that was two of the bays are in the, what we call the non-overflow section. Those are the open bays, uh, 
one is on the left side of the dam and one is on the right side of the dam. And then two, the bays that we evaluated in phase two were within the, what we call the overflow section, uh, which are underneath the spillway and that's bays nine and 23. And those two were, uh, were intentionally selected. Bay nine is, is a bay that has uh, relatively high levels of H2S gas, which are naturally occurring and uh, are accelerating some uh, deterioration within that particular bay. And Bay 23 is within a section of the dam that uh, had slid back or was discovered back in the 80s. And so that's an area of the dam that had moved and that and that issue has been uh, remediated uh, through uh, previous efforts. So that's kind of an overview. So again, these th this uh, the recap that I'll give on these four bays is, you know, there's four out of 40 and those are the bays that were uh, evaluated in phase two slide. So the phase two program was broken up into three main components. There was non-destructive evaluation of those bays. There was also a destructive evaluation, and I'll go through that. And then there was also some water quality uh, analysis work that uh, the BRA environmental group uh, did a great job in supporting us on. So the non-destructive evaluation, there were four test methods, four test methods that were performed on those bays. Again, focusing on the slabs and the cor on and the and the corbels. Uh, impact echo, GPR, hammer sounding, and MIRA, uh, which is an ultrasonic technique. And so again, those were done uh, throughout everything that could be reached on those bays. Those guys spent weeks up on ropes uh, in some pretty grueling conditions and did a fantastic job of getting comprehensive data uh, on, on those four bays. See next slide. So this is just a this is just an overview of some of the data that was extracted from there, and I don't expect you to read this, but I'll kind of walk through it. Uh, the uh, graphic on the left there is uh, a slab section. So the slabs and the corbels, again, those are the high risk components. Uh, so the one on the left is of of one slab section uh, within one of the bays, and uh, it's a summary of the you know, the GPR, the impact echo, the hammer sounding, uh, and the MIRA non-destructive evaluation techniques. And then the one on the right is uh, for a corbel uh, of the same test methods that were done uh, for a corbel section there. See, next slide. So summary of the NDE findings. Um, the corbels on the non-overflow bays there was uh, a high rate of uh, concrete delamination, spalling, and uh, some corrosion that was discovered. Now, this is nothing that was not known already. We've seen some deterioration and some spalling of concrete, but what the NDE evaluation allowed us to do is to look deeper within that concrete and try and assess whether this is primarily shallow delamination associated with rebar corrosion, uh, that's somewhat typical of uh, an 80 year old structure or if there's something larger, more systemic going on within uh, deeper within those corbels. Those corbels are ex uh, extremely important features on the dam. They take all the load of the lake because uh, the slabs rest on them. So having something going on in the interior of those corbels can be uh, problematic. So we really wanted to do a thorough workup on there and look at those corbels and try and understand try and get a good understanding of what's going on within those. And uh, again, one of the NDE findings is that it was bays one and 31, which are the non-overflow bays, which really saw a lot of activity of this delamination uh, and spalling that was going on. Um, whereas bays, the interior bays nine and 23, there were no instances of that. And um, that's primarily attributed to those non-overflow bays are exposed to freeze, uh, freeze thaw, their, their, their environmental exposure helps uh, the freeze thaw cycle helps uh, uh, accelerate deterioration corrosion uh, when it goes through that cycling um, and so that's largely attributed to why the non-overflow bay saw a much higher rate of this than the uh, uh, than the overflow bays Let's see next slide so on the uh, non-overflow Flow bays again. These are the the ones uh, on 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 the two ends of the dam. Uh, there was another finding here that was that was a surprise. Uh, there was uh, delamination that was discovered within several of these slabs. Um, the the good part is that there was no surface evidence discovered yet. That likely means that these are early stages of delamination that's going on. 
uh, within these. And so this is a big driver to what we're going to do in phase three is we want to or we need to investigate further uh, the extent of this deterioration. What's going on? What's driving it? Is it, you know, is it uh, steel corrosion? And if it is, you know, how advanced is that corrosion? How deep is that delamination? Uh, and what are the extents? So uh, that's a big driver to what we're doing in phase three. So let's see. Next slide. So this, the top image is a, is a photograph of that particular slab right there. It's approximately 25 feet wide by about 12 feet tall. Uh, and that's about mid height up in uh, Bay 31 there. And you can see kind of that red hatched, all the red hatched areas in that lower image are the areas that were found uh, through the non-destructive evaluation to be, uh, you know, to have some issues to either be early stages of delamination or some other quality issue in there. We can't see with... You know, we haven't visually looked within the slab yet, but uh, the non-destructive evaluations indicated that there were some uh, issues going on that are likely associated with delamination or some sort of interior issue that's going on there. Uh, and again, that's that's a big driver to what we're going to do in this next phase. Let's see, next slide. And I think there's one more unless that photo, there we go. So this, I wanted to provide, uh, this is a historical photo during the original construction. Uh, because part of phase three is we're going to go through and we're going to saw cut out a section of that slab to take an interior look at the uh, at the slab. And it's important to understand that, you know, the slab is under stress. The, you know, the lake is full and uh, and and so we want to evaluate, you know, what that risk is if we're going to cut into the dam and be within its structural capacity, obviously, before we do that, because we don't want to have to lower the lake level. So this just provides a little context of how thick that slab is. It's about five to six foot thick. And uh, if you got a keen eye there, you can look in the photo. There's there's three people that are standing, uh, are working on the dam just to provide a little bit of scale uh, of how big that slab is. But the intention, uh, again, we'll talk about this more when we get into the different tasks of, of, uh, of phase three is to uh, do some uh, destructive uh, uh, investigation and repair of that slab, uh, in particular of those areas where we found uh, shallow delamination that again, this this was a surprise. Let's see next slide. Um, so the destructive testing summary. Uh, I don't expect you to read all this, but uh, part of what we did is we took a total of 51 cores throughout the dam. Uh, these were done at various locations, uh, very intentionally at different environmental exposures to try and get a good representation of uh, the uh, concrete and steel material throughout the dam. And uh, taking them within different environmental exposures is very important because, you know, those environmental exposures impact, uh, you know, the health of the concrete, you know, what it's exposed to. And, and so we wanted to see what that concrete looks like in detail at those. So some of these were done in normally dry areas. Some of these done at, at, at the bottom of the dam on the upstream side, uh, down at the, at the, basically the lake bottom there. So so uh, normally submerged on the upstream side, also took some at shallow submergence on the upstream side, which deal with much warmer uh, water temperatures, uh, and then also took some in periodically submerged conditions as well. So it took these all throughout the dam. Uh, the good news is of all the, the, the this, this summary here is the strength testing, the uh, compressive strength test results. Uh, the good news is all the strength test re results came back very, very good. We also took a look at previous core tests that were done. Uh, 2018, there were a number of cores that were taken as part of the gate two side seal replacement work. And we also took a look at some cores that were done back in the 80s uh, and took a look at those uh, uh, all together. And in, in, in summary, over those three testing programs over the years, the cores have, from a strength perspective, this is concrete uh, compressive strength, have all performed very well and they're all above the original design strength of 2500 psi um, in this case for class b so and and that one that's highlighted there that was the lowest uh break that we found of 2800 which was still above the minimum design strength so you know overall the the uh, concrete strength and integrity based on the compressive taste, uh, test results came back uh, very good uh, you know and keep in mind this is an 80 year old structure as well Let's see next slide so another part of the destructive testing was doing some lab analysis. Uh, there was uh, five things that the lab did on these concrete cores. Uh, petrographic analysis, which is looking at these through an electron uh, microscope and look at them at the micro 
level. They did some uh, chemical testing, both for chloride and sulfate, and then also some uh, bulk resistivity, uh, uh, which is a for formation factor test, and uh, which also evaluates the health of the concrete and how easily materials like uh, chlorides can get into that material because concrete is porous. And then also did some service life modeling of that uh, of these cores here. Let's see, next slide. So I won't go through this in detail. This is this is a high level overview of the results of the uh, non-destructive or excuse me, the destructive testing of the concrete cores. Um, you know, overall there were, you know, they were sound, intact, uh, well consolidated and in excellent condition, consistent in composition and proportioning uh, with some exceptions. And I'll talk about those exceptions here. Let's see, next slide. So I'm going to focus here on Tris 31. There were two cores and again, there was a total of 51 cores taken with this program. 20 of them went through uh, the uh, went to the lab for detailed analysis and of those 20 cores, two of them, both within buttress 31 showed sides of ASR, uh, alkali silica reaction. So that's a chemical reaction in the concrete that happens over time. And uh, the analogy there, it's often referred to as the cancer of concrete. Uh, it can be very damaging to concrete and is something that really, uh, if, if there is widespread ASR, can be extremely problematic. So this this kind of raised our eyebrows a little bit. Uh, the good news is that it was out of all the cores that we've seen. We haven't really seen this before, but we did find one core with severe ASR and one core with minor ASR uh, damage. So again, that's of particular interest and is going to help drive what we're doing in phase three. And part of what we want to do is evaluate whether uh, this particular condition, the ASR within the concrete, if this is an outlier, if it's truly an outlier, or if this is something that's more systemic, uh, and the and you know are there other areas of the dam that may have this condition going on? And then if so, where are they? And going back to the risk um, approach here, are they within uh, uh, features of the dam that are higher risk features? Right. That's really what we want to try and mitigate our our uh, uh, our program with is the higher risk features. Let's see next slide. So like I said, the third thing we did out there was working with the. Uh, with BRA and your current water quality program that you have up at PK is doing some additional water quality testing really to try and help validate uh, the theoretical model for what's driving or where this H2S gas is coming from within Bay 9. Again, Bay 9 has uh, you know some high concentrations of H2S gas, which has accelerated some of the concrete and steel deterioration within that particular bay. And so we, uh, the intent of the water quality analysis was to uh, essentially validate our theoretical model about the, the origins of that. And essentially, it was successful in that sense that that you have an 80-year-old structure with you know decades of uh, de uh, sediment, which is comprised of decomposing organic matter. And through that uh, organic matter decomposition, um, you get a byproduct that ends up. Uh, coming up through the dam through normal seepage underneath the dam and as it presents itself within that bay it uh, it produces h2s gas which then converts to sulfuric acid and sulfuric acid is you know what's uh, driving some of that deterioration so um, so that was uh, that was good in that result and then it validated kind of our theory on where that was coming from and that can help us understand you know from a long-term perspective you know how do we help mitigate or manage or monitor this deterioration that's going on as a result of the H2S gas. Let's see, next slide. So jumping into phase three, uh, like Mike said, we got four tasks. Uh, task one is uh, focused on that ASR. Again, that, that uh, the infamous uh, Bay 31 cores that came back with ASR. And, uh, and so this, First task is to do a targeted supplemental destructive investigation and testing. And the way we're going to do this is, uh, you know, this last program was primarily coring. Uh, coring is, you know, it takes a little bit longer. You got larger samples that come out and you have to patch those holes back up in there. They can, you know, if you have a large coring program, it can take a lot of time, a lot of money. And, uh, you know, you got to ship those cores to the lab and, and um, uh, go through your series of tests. Well, now we're really focused on looking for other instances of ASR, um, you know, throughout the dam. And so we're going to do this through what's called powder sampling. So it's a 
much lower impact. They can take powder samples very quickly and very, very easily, very easily, and take those powder samples uh, and look for indicators within there that are um, indicative of ASR. And so we can we can get a much bigger footprint uh, across the dam, uh, much quicker, much quicker and easier than taking cores. And there will be some more supplemental cores, but only uh, only a few. I think there's five supplemental cores, and then the uh, the powder sampling program will be about 20 or so powder samples that will be taken. And part of that is going to be going back through the historical records uh, to look for other clues about where where this this particular concrete, um, if it is related to original construction, may be within the dam. And fortunately, the uh, BRA staff of PK kept all the uh, original construction records from the late 30s in early 40s and it's it is in a, in a an impressive treasure trove of original documents typewritten notes from the field engineers the lab the batch plant uh, we're talking thousands of pages of original construction records which are absolutely invaluable and for you guys to have that level of the original documentation is really fantastic and it's it it saves us a lot of time and effort and uh I, i'll i'll say for these old structures too it's pretty rare to have that that level of completion of the original construction records uh, still available. So that's that's a fantastic resource. We're going to go back through those with a fine tooth comb and look for indications of things that were occurring during original construction, batching of the con concrete, other issues that they may have had during construction uh, that can help us narrow the focus here for this task one. Let's see, next slide. So this is essentially this uh, supplemental program. There's going to be a, it's going to be a combination of hammer sounding, um, and again the powder sampling there, which is uh, a low impact method, just to take a, a small sample of the concrete paste out of there in powder form, and then uh, take a few more concrete cores um, out of the dam as well. Let's see next slide, and then task two is. Uh, failure mode progression structural analysis. So again, we have these key slabs or these key features, excuse me, the slabs and the corbels, which are the, which are of particular interest. And before we get into both task three and task four, which is gonna be, uh, we'll talk about those in the next few slides, but before we get into those tasks, you know, task three, we're gonna take out a section of one of the slabs and uh, take a look at uh, the deterioration that was, that, uh, that we discovered that shallow delamination on. So uh, this task two helps us identify, okay, how much material can we comfortably take out? Again, the reservoir is under load. We do not want to have to drain or lower the reservoir to get the load off of these structures. Um, and then also when we get into the repair program approach and we start looking at repair details about uh, having to remove and patch or replace part of those slabs, uh, this task here helps inform how much we can repair at a time uh, without putting the structure at risk. Uh, so these are going to take a very close look at those uh, those two features and it and it select failure modes associated with those that will uh, inform those programs. Let's see next slide. And so task three, destructive investigation and repair support. So again, this was we had that shallow delamination that, that has occurred. Again, no surface evidence. Uh, has presented itself. There's no cracking, spalling that that is observable, at least on the surface. But we know there's something going on inside that dam, or excuse me, inside that slab. So we're going to take out a representative section here and see. Next, next slide. Uh, it'll likely be a small area within one of the areas that tested positive here for uh, some some interior issues. Uh, saw cut out uh, a small piece of that. Uh, uh, take some samples from that that are the uh, and take those to the lab to understand them a little better get good uh, photo documentation and some measurements off of those see how much the steel has uh, deteriorated are we talking about you know negligible section loss is there is there measurable section loss of that steel that steel within that dam there is critical steel to the bending capacity of that slab um, so that uh, that'll help us understand that and uh, inform that. So the, the the two photos on the right there, this was a corbel repair that was done uh, back, um, I think, 2003 or so. Uh, and this was, you know, again, there was some shallow delamination and there was some saw cutting, repairing and exposure of that steel before it was patched back up. So it'll be somewhat similar to uh, those example photos on the right. We'll saw cut out a representative sample and then 
uh, you know, uh, treat that steel and uh, patch it back up. Uh, and then again, this will this will help inform uh, task four. Let's see, next slide. So task four is what we're really here for. Um, this is long term testing and repair program. So uh, part of this is to work with uh, is to conduct a workshop with BRA uh, to discuss the program strategy and taking into consideration your maintenance program, the BRA's maintenance program, your current capital improvement program for there. They have other activities that are going on in the dam. Uh, and they also have the uh, immense capability of the RSMU staff up there as well. And so taking that into consideration for uh, the long term testing and repair program. Um, and then also, you know, prioritization. This is this is an important one. Again, the uh, the four bays that we tested and that's four out of 40. We got 36 more to go. So how do we prioritize those? You know, where do we start? You know, there's going to be other operational considerations, risk, you know, there's a risk component, you know, component to this as well, uh, as well as seasonal um, and a bunch of other factors. So uh, part of this task will go through and look at, how, you know, how do we prioritize uh, this long term program and then preparing repair details. Um, again, all those previous tasks will help inform the repair details uh, for both the slabs and the corbels and, and uh, you know, to get that work done. Uh, and then also identify and prioritize additional testing. You know, we go through these these distinct phases and we come up with some things that we weren't expecting, right? Which is, you know, we always want to maintain an objective look as we go through these. And, um, and, and so there may be things that come up. Uh, and then if they do come up, you know, are there, is there additional testing or monitoring that really comes out of this process, uh, you know, to help reduce that risk? Uh, and then again, this, you know, this whole task is to prepare that long term structural concrete testing and repair program uh, so that this can continue. And um, let's see, next slide. Um, OK, so, yeah, so again, this is just a reminder here. You know, uh, we got four bays that were uh, evaluated in phase two. And again, we got 36 more to go. This is a big structure. Uh, there's a lot of components to it. There's a lot of there's a lot of area to cover some. Uh, that are very difficult to get to. Um, and so how do we, you know, how do we tackle those other 36 bays? Uh, let's see, next slide. And then this year, this is, I think, the last slide here in this deck. This is just a good graphic. I always like this graphic. It shows, you know, uh, it, really the intention of the castle program. You know, you have a, you know, you have a target reliability uh, for the structure and that, you know, you always want to stay above that target reliability of the structure. And, you know, this is an 80 year old structure and they continue their the reliability over time, you know, continues to go down. That's just the nature of, uh, you know, how the structure changes um, through environmental exposure and normal deterioration and, you know, other external factors. And so the target here or the goal here is to extend the service life, you know, through, uh, you know, preventative maintenance. And in this case, you know, uh, prioritized maintenance uh, and, the you know, put those efforts uh, uh, you, you know, where they're really needed to extend the service life. What you don't want to do is get to the point where you've reached that target reliability and now you have to do, you know, essentially, uh, uh, you know, essential or emergency maintenance uh, to, uh, you know, keep the structure in good condition. Those tend to be much more costly uh, or even worse, you know, get below that target reliability and then you're at risk of failure. Um, so that's, that's really the intent of this program is to, you know, through this targeted investigation repair program is to extend the service life of that structure. So I think that's it, Mike, and I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, th th this resolution is uh, presented to the board to amend our current contract uh, with Gannett Fleming to proceed with phase three of the contract. Uh, anticipate the cost is going to be, uh, I think, around the uh, seven, 760 range, something along those lines, less than $800,000. Uh, we, we've got that programmed in the budget, uh, so there's sufficient funds to cover that. Uh, the total cost of phases one, or, or the contract cost, uh, was for phase one and phase two is 1.4 million. Uh, Gannett Fleming has earned uh, 1.3 million to date, so about 93% of the phase or of the uh, uh, contract fee. Uh, I think this is a necessary step to move forward. Uh, Gannett Fleming has been a good, a great partner with us, and uh, uh, I, I would turn it over if you have any questions. One thing I will note is that uh, th there's been no findings of uh, 
you know, a, a damn safety issue necessarily. So no, we're not uh, in any kind of imminent, uh, you know, uh, from that perspective, uh, it's not, not a damn safety issue. But well, we want to be exhaustive and comprehensive and, and look at the structure. Uh, as you said, it's 80 years old. Uh, so uh, it's kind of like us. Once we get a little bit older, uh, we start creaking a little bit. And that's kind of what it's doing. Uh, I will turn it over if you have any questions. Uh, Madam Chairman. All right, are there any questions? I have a question, please. All right, is that Director Crone? Yes, ma'am, and I guess maybe it's not so much a question as it is for Mike and for Stuart. I really want to compliment you because this presentation is just intense with data and information and your flow charts and your graphics and the way you put this together really helped me to understand the gist of it. And even though I wouldn't be able to explain it like an engineer, it helps me to understand it like just the person on the street. And so I thank you for all of the effort that went into that. Yeah, that, that's a shared effort amongst uh, Gannett Fleming and a lot of staff here at the Brazos River Authority. I agree with Director Crone. Um, thank you to Fleming and all of your team. Mike, uh, thank you for your oversight with this project and moving it forward. At this time, I see no other hands raised. So please read the resolution. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager CEO to amend the contract with Gannett Fleming Incorporated to perform Phase 3 engineering services at Moore Shepherd Dam in an amount not to exceed $800,000. You've heard the reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Director Henderson, I move to adopt. Second. I hear a motion by Director Henderson and a second by Ford Taylor. Director Taylor, please pull the board. Presiding Officer Flores? Yes. yes. Director Tallis? Yes. Director Taylor? Yes. Director Fernandez? Yes. Director Henderson? Yes. Director Huber? Yes. Director Crone? Yes. Director Lachance? Yes. Director Lattimore? Yes. Director Leslie? Yes. Director Lloyd? Yes. Director Luton? Yes. Director Rankin? Yes. Director Sanderson? Yes. Director Savage? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Wilson? Yes. Motion carried. Agenda item 11. Discuss, discussion and possible action on surplus. David Thompson, Chief Financial Officer. Okay, what I'd like to do is just kind of discuss a little bit about surplus. Uh, as you probably know, it is a state statute that requires that anytime we want to surplus property, that we must bring it to the board for approval. Uh, I do want to let you know that we do take our time in looking at any time that uh, departments want to surplus properties, those are formally submitted to my department. We review those properties. Uh, we determine whether they're defective, uh, whether they're <clears throat> uh, no longer needed, and or if there's too costly to repair. And if they're no longer needed, we do look to see if there's other departments that might be able to use the properties. And if not, we bring that to the board. After the board approves the uh, surplus of the properties, we place it on a well-advertised auction and it is sold. So let's take a look. I wanna go through and show you that the properties that we plan to surplus. <clears throat> and then if there are not any questions, I'll have the uh, resolution read.
I do want to mention that since we did not do any surplus from last year, we do have quite a backlog of surplus. So I'll be spreading that over the next few uh, board meetings. So if there's no questions, uh, I'd like to have the resolution read, please. I see no hands raised for questions. Go ahead and read the resolution, please. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager CEO to dispose of the following surplus personal property under the terms and conditions that are in the best interest of the Brazos River Authority. Be it further resolved that the Board authorizes the General Manager CEO in certain instances to continue to use and or maintain previously authorized surplus property in a manner that is in the best interest of the Brazos River Authority until appropriate replacement property is received and placed in service. Items no longer needed or repairs not cost efficient. IT Department, Lot 1, 100 various model telephones. Lot 2, 150 various model telephones. Lot 3, one microfiche machine. Lot 4, one projector screen. Lot 5, one projector screen. Lot 6, one HP design jet plotter. Lot 7, one linear LD190 copy machine. Lot 8, four antennas, two projectors, one folding machine, two boxes of blank CDs. Lot 9, 30, is ver 30 various model security cameras, four various antennas, one joystick controller. Lot 10, 14 various printers, six various battery backups, two printer trays, two paper shredders, two toner cartridges. Lot 11, 11 various printers, two boxes of microphones. Lot 12, one typewriter, one Pelco DVR, one Scribe CD duplicator, one box network rack cable management device, 15 network switches, one toner cartridge, six Dell servers, two Dell tape drives, two Dell storage units, one power supply, one firewall. Lot 13, 20 various model Dell monitors. Lot 14, 42 ceiling speakers, 16 wall speakers. Lot 15, 13 riverbed servers, one Dell server, one Polycom RMX server, 10 battery backups. Lot 16, 11 various battery backups, one fax machine, three network ladder racking, three docking stations, miscellaneous cables. Lot 17, one HP design jet plotter. Lot 18, one APC battery backup. Lot 19, various boxes of miscellaneous cables, one monitor, five toner cartridges, one motherboard. Lot 20, four brocade VDX switches, one Dell 3000i, four Dell servers, one quantum tape drive, 32 switches, two brocade ADX controllers, 11 Cisco routers. Lot 21, 18 various polycom systems, four various printers, one printer tray, one Dell server, one Dell desktop, one projector, two TV cards. You've heard the reading of the resolution. Is there a motion to adopt? Director Henderson, so moved. Motion made by Director Henderson, a second made by second. Luton. Director Luton. Please pull the board. Okay. Presiding Officer Flores. Yes. Yes. Director Tallis. Yes. yes. Director Taylor. Yes. Yes. Director Fernandez. Yes. Yes. Director Henderson. Yes. Director Huber. Yes. Director Crown. Director yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, I, I was saying it, but I hadn't unmuted myself. <laughs> okay, Director Lachance. Yes. Director Lattimore. Yes. Director Leslie. Yes. Director Lloyd. Yes. Director Luton. Yes. Director Sanderson. Rankin. Yes. Director Rankin. Yes. Director Savage. Yes. Director Smith. Yes. Director Wilson. Yes. Motion carries. Item number 12, discussion and possible action on Lake Limestone Fiber Optic Upgrade Project by Courtney. Courtney DeBogai, IT Manager. Courtney? Hi there, good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> this, is, um, this project is in regards to sections four and five of our strategic plan, uh, which uh, include maintaining and improving internal and external communications. Uh, we have our, our network bandwidth um, connection maxed out at Lake Limestone office right now at six megabits. 
um, and it's uh, frequently disrupted by environmental conditions. Um, we we joke that every time a cloud forms that we lose one of our T1 lines, um, but it's it, it's true. Um, <clears throat> it's gotten to the point where uh, we have in, the, increased the demand for communications with voice over IP and doing video conferencing and um, the communication between Lake Limestone and the public and central office employees has been um, adversely impacted by the limited bandwidth and unreliable service that we have in the area. So this project uh, would be to install a fiber optic cable to the office, increasing our network uh, bandwidth and providing more reliable service just to maintain daily operations. The uh, total project cost is 616,000. Um, it would be for, uh, installing 14 miles of fiber optic cable. And uh, we also um, completed similar projects to this at PK in East Williamson County over the past couple of years. Um, but uh, we have seek to um, cost share with other businesses in the, in the area, but there's just uh, due to the rural nature of the office and the lack of commerce in the area, uh, haven't been successful in, in finding someone to partner with this. With that being said, um, do I have any questions? Any questions for Courtney? I see none. Please read the resolution. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Brazos River Authority hereby authorizes the General Manager CEO to negotiate and execute a special construction agreement with AT&T for installation of fiber optic cable to BRA's Lake Limestone office for an amount not to exceed $616,000. You've heard the reading of the resolution. Please pull the board. Chairman Flores, I'd like to um, move that we adopt this resolution. Oh. Nice, I will Jen. It. Director <laughs> Wilson will second it. Thank you. Motion made by Henderson and second by Director Wilson. Now we can pull the board. Thank you. Presiding Officer Flores. Yes. Yes. Director Tallis. Yes. yes. Director Taylor. Abstain. Director Fernandez. Yes. Director Henderson. Yes. Director Huber. Yes. Director Crone. Yes. Director Lachance. Yes. Director Lattimore. Yes. Director Leslie. Yes. <clears throat> Director Lloyd. Yes. Director Luton. Director Rankin. Yes. Director Luton, Sanderson. Yes. <laughs> Luton said yes. Yes. We're all fading. Director yes. Sanderson. Did yeah, that, I said yes. Director Savage. Yes. Director Smith. Yes. Director Wilson. Yes. Motion carries. Item 13, report and possible discussion on Brazos Water Master Program presentation by Aaron Abel, Water Services Manager. Aaron, let me uh, let me take this from you if you don't mind. At the last board meeting, I believe it was Director Savage that asked a question about the water master uh, and if we could get an update, and that was just a, a wonderful idea. And we reached out to the water master herself, Miss Molly Muller, and she's going to talk with you just a little bit and tell you uh, about the program. But first of all, I want to just tell you a little bit about Molly. Uh, she is the water master for the Brazos water master program, which began full operation in June 1 of 2015. <laughs> she began her career with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality at the inception of the Concho water master program in 2005. Molly received her bachelor's degree in accounting from San Angelo, Angelo State University and a master's degree from University of Phoenix in management. So, Ms. Muller, we really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Can y'all all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
So the water master programs ensure compliance and monitoring stream flows, reservoir levels, water use, and coordinating diversions. When notified of an intent to divert a specific amount of water at a specific time, a water master may authorize and record the diversion if water is available. And if diversion does not uh, exceed the water right annual authorized appropriation of water. Currently, there are four water master programs in the state, which were created by various methods. The Rio Grande program was established by a court action. The South Texas program was established in response to a declared water division. The Concho River program was established by both a petition of 25 uh, water right holders who successfully proved at the hearing that their water rights were being threatened and that legislative action in House Bill and approved by legislative action in House Bill 2815, passed in regular session at the 79th legislature in 2005. The Brazos program was established by a petition and subsequent order issued by TCEQ commissioners on April 21st, 2014. Water master programs are self-funded any water right within the jurisdiction of the program is required to pay an annual assessment. The assessments include a base fee of $50 per account plus a use fee based on the type of use and amount of water authorized on the certificate of adjudication or a water use report, a uh, water use permit, excuse me. Fees are assessed whether or not the water is used during the year. Water master programs enforce water rights according to the prior appropriation doctrine, which essentially is first in time, first in rights. With offices throughout the basin, the Brazos Water Master Program is able to respond to issues quickly. During drought times, the program is able to assist all water right holders and if needed, ensure water is passed through reservoirs for senior water rights. Water master deputies conduct regular inspections. If a water right holder doesn't comply with a water right or the rules, the water master may prevent the owner from diverting, taking, storing, or distributing water until the issue is corrected. The water master may, per may pursue appropriate enforcement action when there is a violation of or failure to comply with statutes in Texas Water Code and rules in Texas Administrative Code, the terms of a water right, authorization, or orders issued by the commission or water master. This could include a notice of violation, notice of enforcement, or field citation. Both the notice of enforcement and field citation could result in monetary penalties. So how was the Brazos Water Master Program established? In January 2013, water right holders petitioned TCEQ requesting the appointment of a water master. In February 2013, TCEQ commissioners referred the petition to the State Office of Administrative Hearings. And in late 2013, the judge's recommendation was for a water master program. In April of 2014, TCEQ commissioners evaluated the Brazos Basin and directed the executive director to appoint a water master over the middle and lower basin. The Brazos Water Master Program was implemented in June 1st, 2015. The program begins at Lake Possum Kingdom, including the lake down to the Gulf at Freeport and encompasses 41 counties in Central and East Texas. The program started with seven full-time employees, the water master, assistant water, I'm sorry, administrative assistant, and five deputies. 
Originally, there were two deputies in the Stephenville office, two in the Waco office, and one in Angleton. We found that the Central Basin was not getting enough coverage due to the time it took to drive to that area. So we reorganized our deputies, moving one from Stephenville to a field office in College Station. After a little while, we quickly realized that we needed additional full-time employees to cover the scope of the program. We received three additional full-time positions for the program, which included an assistant watermaster, an additional administrative assistant, and another deputy. Today, there are six deputies scattered across the basin. They oversee a constantly changing, dynamic surface water system of rivers and tributaries that allow diversions as water is available and as it passes individual diversion points. Currently, one of our administrative assistant positions is vacant. We are evaluating the need to reclassify this position to one of a technical nature. Each water master program is funded by accounts held separate by the agency's fiscal division. Every biennium, meaning every two, fiscal, every two fiscal years from February, uh, sorry, September 1st to August 31st, the Texas legislature establishes appro appropriations for all state programs, including the water master programs. These appropriations give permission to spend funds for expenses incurred during the fiscal year. Early each spring, each water master program must estimate the amount of revenue needed to pay the expenses of the program for the upcoming year. These amounts are based on historical expenses and anticipated needs and are itemized to correspond with TCEQ's budget category. The fiscal year budget is then completed to estimate the amount of assessments each water right holder will be required to pay. This was last year's proposed budget submitted to the Water Master Advisory Committee, as well as in the lower uh, left-hand side, BRA's assessment for the last four years. Each Water Master program has a Water Master Advisory Committee who must meet every July to review the proposed budget before it is submitted to the Commission in August for approval. Brazos Water Master Program assessments, which are mailed in late October, are based on a 98.5% collection rate, and any fees collected in excess of the operational needs goes into a fund balance. The fund balance maintains a six-month operating balance and is used at the beginning of the fiscal year until assessments are collected. Texas Water Code and Texas Administrative Code provide guidance on who are required to pay an assessment and how the assessment accounts are set up, as well as the specific breakdown of the fee structure. Assessment rates are determined by using this formula in Section 304.62. Also stated, water may not be diverted, taken, stored, transported or used by any diverter while the assessment is in delinquent status. Watermaster advisory committees support each watermaster program, providing recommendations to the watermaster on water administration and distribution activities that would benefit water right holders, reviewing and providing input to the executive director on the proposed budget of the water master operations and providing assistance as requested by the water master program or water right holders. The Brazos Water Master Advisory Committee consists of 13 members from BRA, Gulf Coast Water Authority, Dow Chemical, NRG Power, Alcoa, Luminate Power, City of Waco, City of Temple, Somerville County Water District, Palapinto County, uh, sorry, Palapinto Municipal Water District number one, as well as three irrigators scattered across the basin. 
Title 30 of Texas Administrative Code 304.13 requires diverters to have measuring devices installed prior to diverting water. This is true for water right holders as well as Brazos River Authority customers. Once the measuring device is installed, then the diverter must call our office to schedule a time for a deputy to certify the meter. Once the measuring device is certified, then they can request a diversion. Water right holders must contact our office at least 24 hours in advance and must get approval before starting a diversion. Communication is key during a diversion period to report any changes to the Declaration of Intent to Divert, or DOI. Once the diversion period is complete, a pump operation report is mailed or emailed to the diverter and must be signed and returned to our office within seven days of receipt to validate the diversion. Brazos Watermaster Program staff perform stream flow measurements to ensure USGS gauges are reporting correctly, also on water courses that don't have gauging stations. Some water rights within our basin require diverters to install stream flow markers. As stated in the special conditions, we assist them in the installation of these markers. We have several interesting sites in our basin. This is one of the pictures from Lake Leon's Morning Glory outflow in Eastland County. This is taken on Fort Hood. We follow the city of Gatesville water operator to their diversion point and plant. And on our way back, soldiers were in the process of a training exercise. We were required to wait until the exercise was completed, which was about 30 minutes. Log jams are inevitable, especially on water courses like the Leon River upstream of Lake Belton. The Leon River is very windy and can cause logs to accumulate. TCEQ on its own motion or written request from a commissioner's court shall investigate the natural obstruction. On completion of the investigation, if the commission determines that the obstruction is creating a hazard or is having other detrimental effect on the, on the navigable stream, the commission shall initiate action to remove the obstruction with or without assistance from other federal and state agencies. When the Water Master Program was first implemented, there was resistance, but nearly six years under our belt, we have changed the minds of some of those resisting. Our goal is always to allow each water right holder to utilize as much water as possible while staying within the confines of their water right. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present a general overview of the Brazos Water Master Program to you today. Are there any questions? Thank you, Molly. I believe Director Savage, I saw your hand up. I just wanted to say thank you. I was the one who asked for the presentation and uh, you know, I actually grew up along the Concho River in San Angelo, so I know how precious water is out there too. But thank you. This was very, very helpful in understanding uh, the role and it's kind of unique. It, it doesn't, you know, not every watershed has them, so I appreciate it very much. No problem at all. I don't see any other hands raised. Molly, okay. thank you again for uh, coming out and uh, giving us this presentation. It's very helpful um, to keep us reminded as to what this process is. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> the Board of Directors will conduct a closed meeting and executive session on the following matters. A to consult with the attorney regarding litigation with respect to the Allens Creek Reservoir, pursuant to the authority granted by Section 551.071 of the Texas Open Meetings Act, codified as Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, and to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property in Austin County in relation to Allens Creek Reservoir, pursuant to the authority granted by Section 551 0.072 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. 
board members, you've received a separate meeting link to access the executive session. Please disconnect from this meeting and access that meeting link at this time. For those remaining on this meeting link, the board will return to this open session link upon completion of the executive session and prior to taking, if any, it taking action, if any, on items discussed in executive session. Hereby reconvenes into open session at 2.15 p.m. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn at this time. Director Huber, I so move. A motion made by Director Huber, a second by? Luton. Director Henderson. And Director Luton, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we are adjourning at 216. Thank you very much. Everybody have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. You too. So long, everybody. Adios.